पहिला आमचं लवकर म्हणजे तुम्ही लवकर आला तर बरं होईल असं म्हणतो हा ठीक आहे ओके ठीक ठीक आहे चालेल ही विल जॉईन विदिन टेन मिनिट्स ओके ओके Prasadji, how is going in NCL, full fledge? Yeah, yeah, almost. Yes. Yeah. Now we have a lot of problems in other labs. Uh, there are many people who are COVID positive. In yes. Trichur and oh. Hyderabad. Yeah, AT Madras yesterday said they had some problem. Mm -hmm. I heard. Okay. Yeah. But I think this is kind of, <laughs> this is a new normal as they say. Oh, in yes. <laughs> I don't know. What But like, you know, the, the age group that the students are in, I think they are the lowest mm. uh, at risk. But the NCL is okay, no problem. Nobody is there. So far, we have done fairly okay. I am actually leading the task force of the student, uh, you know, <laughs> returning to the hostels and the, to the lab. So what we have done is we have... basically we split the students into two batches and uh, each batch is coming for three days that is you know maintaining so we are almost having 400 students on campus uh, close to 400 every day uh, if we have all of them that it will become almost close to 700 so we are kind of splitting them into two batches and then asking them to come for three, three days each But in uh, this director is additional child, no? Yeah, right now it is additional child. Yes. But the interview is already over or not yet? It was over quite a long time ago, almost close to two months now, I think. How are things, Umesh? Ah, huh? pardon. No, Umesh, how are things? Hello, good morning. should we get going uh, yeah maybe then like you know yeah. the other can add, add join yeah. because he said 10 minutes we already close to 5 minutes now so in another 5 minutes he might join meanwhile we can finish the other agenda if you okay professor to be uh, whether we can start yes sir we are ready yeah shall we start yeah 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 yes 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 please go ahead and start okay thank you very much sir uh, my colleague will uh, Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good. We will start our session. Good morning, all. On the behalf of Ahmed Nagar Jilla Maratha Vidya Prasarak Samaj, our parent institute and department of chemistry, New Arts Commerce and Science College, Parnell, on the occasion of inaugural function of this workshop, I would like to welcome a great personalities and our mentor. Professor G D Yadav, Director of I C T Mumbai, and President of Maharashtra Academy of Sciences. Professor S B Krupani, the President, Materials Research Society of India, Bangalore. Dr. Bharat Kaya, Director General of Cement Pune, who supported us for for organizing this joint event, and our keynote speakers, Professor Umesh Vaghmare, J N C S R I I C Bangalore, Rahul Panna, Associate Professor, Department of Mechanical. Engineering, Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh, USA. Dr. Datta Tray Latte, National Chemical Laboratory, Pune. Honorable Principal Hello. and Vice Principal of our College, 
and all the participated teachers, students, That's and good. researchers in the international workshop on advances in functional materials, a workshop jointly organized by Maharashtra Academy of Sciences, Pune, Material Research Society of India, Bangalore, and Department of Chemistry of this college. Welcome to all participants and delegates. Now, may I request Vice Principal of our college, Professor Dr. Tobesar, for welcome address. Sir, please. Good morning, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Good morning, all of you. Honorable Professor G. D. Yadav, sir. Padma Sri Awardee, J. C. Bose Fellow, India, and former Vice Chancellor, as well as Director, Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai. Honorable Professor Umesh Wagmari, sir. Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Awardee, Jawaharlal Nehru Center, Bengaluru. Dr. Bharat Kale, sir. Director General CMET Pune, Professor S. B. Krupanidhi, sir, President Material Research Society of India, ISC Bengaluru, Professor Rahul Panat, sir, from USA, Dr. Datta Late, our alumnus and scientist from NCL Pune, Honorable Principal of our college, Dr. Ranganath Ahir, sir, participants from various institutes, convener of this workshop, Mr. Anil Dole, my colleagues, on the behalf of our parent institute, Ahmadnagar Jinnah Maratha Vidya Prasarik Samaj, Ahmadnagar, and New Arts Commerce and Science College, Parner, I wish very warm welcome to one and all in this international workshop sponsored by Maharashtra Academy of Sciences, Pune. I would like to say a few words about our institute and the organizing department. Our college is established in 1977 in the form of arts and commerce faculty, and it is extended in the form of science faculty in 1992. Presently, the college is accredited for the third time with A grade by NAC and is ranked by National Institutional <coughs> Ranking Framework in the rank band of 101 to 150. College is recipient of more than 20 prestigious awards from Government of India, Government of Maharashtra, as well as Savitribai Pule Pune University, such as Atal Ranking Innovation Award, Best College Award, Best Principal Award. Our college has been recognized and honored with the financial support from UGC, DST through PIST program, RUSA, as well as Royal Society of Chemistry Mumbai chapter. The Department of Chemistry was established in 1992 in the form of UG course and is now recognized as a well-known PG center for chemistry as well as SPPU recognized research center for chemistry. This department is catering the educational needs of more than 1,000 students in the form of BSc, MSc, as well as PhD courses and some skill enhancing certificate courses on safety as well as instruments handling. Our students have excelled in the university examinations and secured university ranks many times. Many of them have completed PhDs from renowned institutes like IHCT Mumbai, National Chemical Laboratory Pune, ISER Pune, and IIT Mumbai uh, from India, as well as some of them have availed prestigious fellowships like DAD, Humboldt, Marie Curie, JSPS, DFG, Ramanujan for their PhDs and postdocs abroad and are serving for various organizations in India in the form of various positions. Many times we have been supported by Dr. Bharat Kale for organizing such a kinds of events as well as for establishing our research center. Today we gathered here with the help of an online meeting to understand and discuss the advances in material research. We are very happy and excited to listen to eminent speakers. Hence, without taking much more time, I congratulate the Department of Chemistry for organizing this event at international level. And once again, I welcome you all in this virtual workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your welcome address. Now we have to move towards the inaugural addresses. 
I feel immense pleasure to introduce today's speaker present on the occasion of inaugural function of this workshop. First of all, I would like to introduce Dr. Bharat Kale sir, Director General, CIMET Pune. Dr. Bharat Kale sir is presently scientist and director in CIMET Pune and has a huge experience in research and development of electronic materials. He has completed his post graduation in physical chemistry in 1986 at University of Pune and completed the PhD in well-known research institute, National Chemical Laboratory, Pune, in 1991. After joining to CIMET, Pune, he had been a University of Leeds, UK, in 1996 as a visiting scientist, and in Korea from 2005 to 2014 as a brain pool fellow. He has expertise in synthesis of nanostructure materials. He has also experience in glass fabrications Kare sir is expert in glass nanocomposites preparations and its photocatalytic study. He is also working on lithium ion and lithium air batteries. He has more than 290 papers in well reputed international and national journals and has more than 24 patents on his credit. He has maximum external funding that is more than $1.5 million for the projects. So he has visited many countries and delivered lectures in national and international conferences. Due to his work in the field of research, he got many awards and recognition. Few of them I would like to highlight. He is a life member of Material Research Society of India. He is a fellow of Maharashtra Academy of Sciences. He got Material Research Society of India gold medal award in 2012. And a very important thing is, he is a key person for organizing this workshop. Now, May I request to Dr. Bharat Kare, sir, to start the session. Please, sir. Thanks to... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to uh, uh, Art and Science, Art, Commerce and Science College partner for organizing this uh, event. First of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, MRSA President, uh, Professor Kupanidhi, sir, because uh, he has given us valuable time today. Also, Professor uh, Yadav, he is a president of Maharashtra Academy of Science. So, both the organizations are looking for the uh, promotion of science uh, in the country, basically um, MSc in the Maharashtra. And this year, we, have, we are targeting uh, the uh, rural areas where we can uh, have the uh, lecture so that uh, the, the, the students from the rural area can be benefited. And this is, uh, this is the second attempt we are making with the uh, New Arts and Commerce Science College partner. Uh, there are many, uh, see, it's located in the uh, rural area where uh, the students come, come, come from the small, small villages to this college. So these students will be get benefited out of this uh, functional material uh, webinar. I would like to also thank to uh, uh, our MRSI uh, other members, uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Prasad, uh, Dr. Rane is a uh, secretary of the MRSA Pune chapter. Then um, Shelke Madam, she is the treasurer of the uh, MRSA Pune chapter. As well as MSc members, uh, Mukund Deshpande and uh, Mukund Deshpande is uh, actively involved in the MSc. As well as uh, Vice President of uh, Pune uh, Maharashtra Academy is uh, uh, Krishna. So, Dr. Radha Krishnan uh, is not there today, I think, but uh, um, they are also actively involved in this MSc, and we are our MSc uh, job is to. Uh, take this science to the uh, area where uh, remote areas, like uh, in tribal area and other, uh, other places. We are trying that and uh, this is the, and actually uh, today we have a good speaker, uh, Professor Wagmare is fantastic. Uh, uh, you can see his uh, uh, work and Yes, sir, you can join, sir. You can join the link. No, no, registration. Sir, registration is here. 
तुमचं नाव आणि हे टाकायचं फोन नंबर नाही ठीक आहे ठीक आहे नो प्रॉब्लेम करा दोन मिनिटाच आहे सर इस प्रोफेसर यादव इज जॉइनिंग वेरी सुन See, I told them that they are not. Alega. Okay, what about it? Then Sangal boy do that. Heal, sir. No, no, that's a Kali link, right? लिंक रजिस्ट्रेशन नंतर खाली एक लिंक है सर हाँ तीस तीस हॅलो आता ऐकू येते का हा येते ओके चला सुरू करा आम्ही सुरू केलेलं आहे थोडस सर इंट्रोडक्टरी तुम्ही साडे नऊ सांगितलं होतं मला टुडे वी हॅव थँक्यू सर वेलकम फॉर द प्रोग्राम अँड प्रोफेसर कुर्बानी जाल सुद्धे ओके अँड थँक्स टू अवर स्पीकर प्रोफेसर उमेश वाघमारे and uh, another speaker uh, uh, panet because specifically i would like to hear from uh, rahul panet on the additive manufacturing so we uh, is very uh, new area where uh, he is going to uh, have expertise so uh, that's why uh, be, uh, specifically we put his lecture today and uh, dr latte he is also talking on the uh, some uh, his area in materials and uh, the the uh, this uh, the uh, uh, motto of this workshop is to uh, as i already told that professor um, yadav is very keen to uh, take this uh, science uh, science to uh, to tribal areas to the maharashtra academy and we are doing this and under his guidance we did it same thing uh, under the guidance of professor uh, upanidhi uh, we are trying mrsa uh, pune chapter uh, in very act- uh, working very actively and we are doing that to the uh, dr prasad and our other young colleagues thank you very much uh, thanks uh, thanks to uh, co- uh, thanks to parmer college and their uh, sausta for um, providing all this uh, infrastructure as well as um, uh, 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 arranging this uh, p- uh, workshop on function, uh, seminar on uh, functional materials uh, Uh, through their college thank you very much thanks thank you sir hmm. i would like to welcome professor gd yadav sir sir just join the meeting now uh, next eminent personality i would like to introduce is professor sb prupanidhi president material research society of india iic bangalore professor sb krupanidhi is a presently professor and president of mrsi iic bangalore and cimet uh, iic bangalore and has a huge experience in research and development of ferroelectric materials he has completed his post graduation in applied physics in 1975 at andhra university and completed the phd in delhi university in 1981 he had been a university of queens kingston in canada from 1981 to 
As postdoctoral fellow from 1984 to 1988, he had been a principal scientist, Motorola, USA. He had been professor of engineering science in Pennsylvania University, USA. He has expertise in synthesis of ferroelectric materials, semiconductors, quantum dots, optoelectronics, and lithium ion batteries. He has more than 372 papers in well reputed international journals. Sir has visited many countries and delivered lectures in national and in international conferences. He has many honors and awards. He has fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering 2012, member of the Asia Specific Academy of Materials 2003, fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences Bangalore 2003. Sir has awarded prestigious award like a CNR Rao prize lecture for advanced material. Jesse was fellow, Rustum Choksi Medal for Research Excellence. Tata Kim Chair Professorship, Indian Institute of Science, Vaishwik Medal, MRSI Medal, two Engineering Invention Awards at Motorola, USA. I heartily welcome, sir. Now, may I request Professor Rupanidhi, sir, to start the session, please, sir. Uh, Dr. Dhole, may I, am I say Pune chapter uh, as a president, can I say two words, please? This is Prasad, VLV Prasad. Professor Krupanadi, if you give me permission, I will just welcome on behalf of the MRSI Pune chapter. At Kale, may I just say a few words? To yeah, 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 sir, please. Yeah, yeah uh, good morning, one and all. Uh, Professor G.D. Yadav, President of Maharashtra Academy of Sciences and uh, former Vice Chancellor ICT Mumbai, uh, uh, Professor Krupanadi, the MRSI India uh, uh, President, uh, Professor Tube, uh, and Dr. Dhole of New York Commerce uh, and Science College partner, uh, Dr. Kale, the uh, local uh, a big support to MRSI Pune chapter, and the Director General of CMET Pune. I welcome you all uh, uh, to this uh, half a day uh, international workshop on advanced functional materials. On behalf of MRSI Pune chapter, I thank all the uh, people who are involved in this uh, organization. Uh, today we are uh, starting on a slightly sober note uh, because we just lost uh, a true Indian uh, and son of the soil, Padma Vishnavadi, uh, a great uh, leader of uh, eminence, uh, Professor Rodam Narsimha. Uh, I think like, you know, uh, by celebrating science only, we can pay tributes to such great personalities. So on that note, I think like, you know, it is good that we are doing this workshop, uh, but like, you know, let us all pay respects to uh, the departed soul. And uh, I pray that like, you know, the family gets the strength and we all scientists as, are, uh, as a big family uh, in his, uh, this one, you know, let us pray uh, for, his, uh, for the departed soul. Uh, with this, uh, thank you all for giving me this opportunity. Over to you, Dr. Gode. Sorry to take you, uh, take this time. Thank you very much for it. This opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now, we are very much fortunate to have a renowned personality, Padma Sri Professor G.D. Yadav, sir, director of an ICT Mumbai. Former director and vice chancellor of ICT Mumbai and president of Maharashtra Academy of Sciences, Pune. We express our gratitude to Professor G.D. Yadav, sir, for encouragement and support to organize this international workshop on advances on functional materials. I would like to say a few words about, sir. Professor G.D. Yadav is one of the topmost highly prolific and accomplished engineering scientists. <coughs> he is internationally recognized by many prestigious awards as an academician, researcher, and innovator, including his similar contributions to education, research, and innovation in green chemistry and engineering catalysis, chemical engineering, energy engineering, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and development of clean and green technology. He served as the founding vice chancellor and RT Modi distinguished professor and Tata Chemical Darwari said distinguished professor of leadership and innovation at the Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai. He currently holds the titles of Emeritus Professor of Eminence and J.C. Bosch National Fellow in ICT. He served as an adjunct professor at University of Success One, Canada, RMIT University, Melbourne, Australia, Conjoint Professor, University of Newcastle, Australia, 
he was conferred padma shri the fourth highest civilian honor by the president of india in 2016 for his outstanding contributions to science and engineering he has been a recipient of two honorary doctorates dsc and d engineering from agartala in the recent november 2020 survey of stanford university where indian scientists in top 2% of those in the world are honored professor yadav is number 1 in india in physical chemistry which is within a 0.2% of the world scientists and is ranked 66th which is a remarkable his research productivity is phenomenal with supervision of 101 doctoral and 122 master thesis which is the first record in the icd and for any engineering professors in india besides he has supervised 37 post doctoral fellows he has published 463 original research papers 118 national and uh, national patents three books and uh, more than 13000 citations in the journals patent books and monographs under his dynamic leadership icd made phenomenal progress having been declared as a category first institute having and uh, having started 23 new academics programs five new departments and several centers of excellence and establishment of two off campuses in bhuneshwar and marathwada at jalna he has won over 125 national and international honors awards fellowships editorships and several lifetime achievements awards by prestigious industrial organizations he has an elected fellow of insa iic national academy of sciences india indian national academy of engineering as well as the world academy of sciences he is a fellow of royal society of chemistry uk institution of chemical engineering uk indian institute of chemical engineering indian chemical society and indian society for technical education among others he is currently the president of indian chemical society and editor in chief journal of ics being published by the lco he is the founder president american Ke- american chemical society of india international chapter he is on editorial board of prestigious journals like acs sustainable chemistry and engineering green chemistry applied catalysis journal of journal of molecular catalysis communications uh, catalysis communications international journal of chemical reactor clean technologies and environmental policies he has been a member or chaired several national and international committees of mhrd dsd dbt ugc aicte csir he was chairman research council of csir csm cri he is member of rc of iict hyderabad and niist trivandrum he served as independent director on four renowned public limited companies rt industry limited godrej industries private limited megamani organics limited and bagheria chemicals limited and uh, clean science and technology private limited he is also a member of apex council of india oil and r&d expert advisory committee ongc energy center glexon india advisory boards on process safety and governing council dbt indian oil energy centers and member of the dbt pan iit center for biotechnology he is the chairman of dst national expert advisory committee on the innovation incubation and technology enterprise he is member of advisory and training committee of the common research and technology development hubs of dsir he is the chairman pact of international programs in chemical sciences and engineering dst and chairman Uh, uh, expert committee waste management technology he is a member of the maharashtra government expert committee on the nep 2020 it is huge varata uh, we are very grateful to professor gd yadav sir for being here and give us a valuable time so without taking too much time i would like to request professor gd yadav sir for uh, to start his uh, lecture thank you very much uh, you know uh, professor kripani ji professor wagmare dr bharat kale dr thube dr dole other distinguished uh, members guests uh, the 
associates of this uh, new college of uh, arts science and commerce uh, in parmer ahmednagar uh, and of course uh, the material research society of india uh, thank you so much for joining hands with the maharashtra academy of sciences and we have decided in our academy that uh, we'll organize uh, seminars webinars nowadays in association with others uh, like minded are having similar goals so i'm very happy that material research society uh, as well as the parner college or joint hands and our idea is to go to uh, remote areas within maharashtra and bring uh, you know entire students and faculty to join science and do something worthwhile and uh, uh, particularly this topic on functional materials very dear to me because uh, uh, catalysts are functional materials as you know that and in recent years uh, particularly the functional materials have been used in variety of different areas whether you know the applications uh, run in electrical chemical you know physical biological or any other uh, you know applications uh, where we you know things can range from uh, few nanometers uh, to a bigger sizes micrometers and we know that uh, there's a uh, some of these things are for instance the memory alloys and things like that which have been talked a lot and in that you have the functional composite materials also i think today we are going to have discussions on that and uh, that is a great area particularly for instance you know conductive composite materials or magnetic materials you know and uh, a lot of people have worked in different areas whether you know in chemical industries we, we work on carbon black and carbon fiber and many metal powders and many other things or you combine them with resins and polymers and what not so that area of functional materials is very very important for today's society and i'm very happy that uh, uh, maharashtra academy of sciences a joint hand and uh, uh, this parner college is uh, you know taking the lead i'm i'm sure that we what i had announced uh, during the agm of maharashtra academy that practically every you know fortnight we'll uh, join hands with some college and arrange uh, seminars and webinars in different areas uh, so that you know the message of science is spread across so with this few words uh, i once again uh, compliment dr bharat kare for taking a lead and i'm very happy that umesh wagmare is going to speak and uh, and of course uh, this uh, will be a, a great uh, uh, webinar i'm sorry because i have to join another meeting at 10 o'clock uh, you know so so i i i love to leave but uh, i wish uh, the uh, webinar a great success thank you very much thank you sir thank you very much sir now may i request professor krupanidhi sir for few words uh, on the occasion of inaugural function incidentally i am i'm sorry i forgot that we paid tributes to rodam narsimhan he was a great engineer and who was respected so much uh, in scientific and engineering community so we pay tributes to him krupani ji sir okay good morning to all good morning sir yeah a little down because we just la- lost a very good friend of mine rodam narsimhan friend for so many years so anyway we being about him coming back to this conference it is really my pleasure to know what you all professor yado dr kale and dr gule and dr tube and all these eminent speakers such as professor umesh wagmari and dr rahul panar and late it's a good collection of people going to speak today in conference this is a one day international workshop good idea because the nowadays pandemic time and we are losing touch with each other these learners are going to keep us in touch and ignite our scientific thinking all the time so i just welcome all of you and the participants from all over who are here to exchange experience and work together on the exciting field of functional materials and their applications 
I first wish to extend to you all the greetings of the MRSI. It was this body being responsible for bringing together the vast community in India, working in the area of advanced functional materials. Sometimes we fear that some mentioned in discussing that the opportunity of continuing the series of international conferences of advanced functional materials, that the field may be diminishing interest due to current pandemic going on, is clearly eliminated when the, one sees the, the amount of participation of celebrities in the area of functional this conference. It's very, very encouraging and very, very refreshing. In these times, calling for social relevance of scientific activities, it's very fortunate to see the important part taken in this conference by applications. As it is evident in the open fora that the level of applications emerging from the advanced of functional materials is far exceeding the expectations and serving the human society for a better living in the form of wide variety of sensors, activators, detectors, etc., and bringing the enormous amount of social impact. The innovative lectures planned today by stalwarts such as Professor Umesh Wagmare and Dr. Rahul Panath and Latte is really adding a flavor to this collection of people today and clearly establish the fact that by covering the various aspects relevant to this context. Currently, various combinations of functional materials, various new applications, and various newer perspectives in this family of materials make the functional materials more relevant to and timely. Before closing my address here, I, I would extend further thanks to institutions who greatly helped in organizing this conference, MRSI, Maharashtra Academy of Sciences, and the New Art Science College. Before I turn over the conference to the organizers, I'd like to thank the organizers and all participants for taking immense interest in making this conference a success. This conference is definitely a wonderful addition to our calendar. Let me now close by wishing you all a delightful and stimulating evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. I'd like to thank Professor G.D. Yadav, sir, Professor Krupanidhi, sir, and Professor Vibhi Kale, sir, for being here and guide us and support us for organizing this uh, international conference. Now, uh, we, we have to move towards the keynote addresses. First of all, I would like to introduce Professor Umesh Wagmare, sir, Theoretical Science Unit, Jawaharlal Nehru Center of Advanced Scientific Research, IIC Bangalore. His, uh, his field of research is theory modeling and simulations of condensed matter and materials. I would like to say a few words about his education. He has completed BTEC Engineering Physics in physics in 1990 from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, and MS and MPhil in applied physics in 1994 94, from Yale University, New Haven, USA. He had completed his PhD in applied physics in 1996 from Yale University, New Haven. During 1996 to 1998, he had been a postdoctoral fellow at physics department, Harbour University. From 1998 to 2000, he had been a research associate at physics department, Harvard University. From 2000 to 2005, he joined assistant professorship at theoretical science unit, JNCSR Bangalore. 2010 to 2012, he was adjunct professor at Burke Nanotechnology Center, Purdue University. From 2014, he is adjunct professor in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Since 2009, he is a professor at theoretical science unit. Jane CSR Bangalore. He visited many countries as a vis visiting professor. Sir has published more than 250 research articles in national and international journals and seven chapters in books. He is editor of many journals. He is editor of Pramana Journal of Physics. He has membership of several bodies. He is a secretary council Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, member of the editorial board of solid state communications, member of the research council, advanced materials and powder research institute. Bhopal, uh, he is a member of Nano Science Advisory Group, uh, Government of India. He is a member of Physical Sciences Committee, CSR Government of India. He delivered more than 20 invited talks in national and international conferences. He made a significant contribution to the field of research 
particularly in ferroelectrics, electronic topological transitions, nanoscale materials, mechanical deformations and of materials, multiferroics and dilute magnetic semiconductors, materials for energy and environments, development of formalism and methods. Due to his exceptional work in the material research, he got several national and international awards, particularly few of them, Shanti Sarup Bhatnagar Prize in Physic Physical Sciences, CSIR India in 2010, Infosys Science Prize in 2015, he is a fellow of Indian National Science Academy 2014. He was uh, Indi Indian Citation Award. He got Indian Citation Award in 2010. Thomson Reuters Research Excellence Award in 2012. He has been awarded J.C. Bose National Fellowships, Government of India in 2012. Also, IBM Faculty Award in 2009. DAE Outstanding Researcher Grant Award, Government of India from 2009 to 2014. He was Fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore in 2008. Fellow of National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, 2007. B.M. Birla Science Prize in Physics, 2005. MRSI uh, Medal in the year 2005. Young Faculty Grant Award in 2004. Associate Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, 2001. Uh, we are we are grateful, sir, for accepting our invitations and being here. We are eagerly waiting for your talk. We are request you to invitations, sir. Please, sir. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I will share my screen and. Uh, I think you need to enable me to share my screen, please. So ask everyone else to mute their mics, please. Please mute your mics except Dr. Wagmare. Others should mute their mics. Okay, can you all hear me? No? Yeah. yeah, yes, Umesh, we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Dole. I'm honored to be here with Professor Yadav, Professor Krupanidhi, Professor Prasad, Dr. Thube, Dr. Kare, and Professor Panat, and Dr. Latte, uh, and all of you, my friends. I'm looking forward to this opportunity where I have uh, been enabled by Maharashtra Academy of Sciences and MRSI to have interactions with uh, the students and teachers from the uh, new college uh, in Ahmednagar. Uh, and also, uh, it's a good opportunity for me. Uh, I must thank Professor Dr. Dare Kare for reaching out to me and getting me involved in this. I really appreciate Dr. Kare's effort in making this possible. Uh, I'll get started with my talk now. Uh, it, this talk is uh, generally about ferroelectric crystals, something Professor Krupanidhi is a great expert in. And uh, th this is really meant for college students and teachers. So I, I, I'm sorry if this is too simple for experts in the audience. I'll also emphasize on the fundamental science and applications that come out of this uh, and has a strong link with the research activities I do uh, in Bangalore. So let me get started. Uh, outline of this talk is as follows. I'll first give an introduction to ferroelectric crystals uh, in three dimensional uh, materials. And uh, these are very useful functional materials and very suitable for the theme of today's workshop. Uh, then I will talk about ferroelectricity at nanoscale because all of us want to have miniaturized devices and want to know what happens to these functional properties when the device becomes too small uh, and are there limitations on the size limitations on devices. In the second part, I will talk about ferroelectricity in two-dimensional crystals, uh, something which started from work in my group 
Uh, and this is sort of takes the pyroelectricity at nanoscale to the next level. And this topic also relates to what Dr. Latte will be talking about uh, in 2D materials, uh, particularly MOS2 and niobium nitride. And finally, I will talk about uh, some very exciting development, which I hope even uh, Professor Krupanidhi will find interesting, uh, something we call as scale-free ferroelectricity in hafnium oxide, and where we show a combination of nanoscale two-dimensional dipolar sheets, uh, which are sort of part of uh, 3D crystal. So let me first introduce what is ferroelectric materials. Uh, it's a class of smart functional materials where I, I will just use a mouse. Just give me a second. Okay, you can see the mouse. Uh, if this is a ferroelectric material, it has an electric dipole moment present in this inside this material. And if you apply a pressure on it, mechanical stimulus, it changes this dipole moment and you can detect it using electrical circuit. And that's how it can be used as a sensor. Conversely, you can also apply electrical voltage to this material and change this dipole moment electrically. And that results in mechanical response, expansion or contraction of this uh, chunk of material. And this operation is called actuator operation. And that's why this combination of sensing and actuating give uh, ferroelectrics a basically smart functionality. And that have lots of lots of applications, okay? Um, this is the property which is used in speakers, both speakers, heartbeat monitors in the hospitals, um, naval submarines where they want to detect surroundings using sound waves, sonars, and a variety of other things. Okay, your smartphones have uh, microphones and speakers which are also made up of similar materials. Uh, another very important property of ferroelectrics is basically called switchability. And if you apply large negative voltage to this material, you can flip this electric dipole moment down. And that can be used as storing computer memory in the form of binary information, like up giving you uh, one and down giving you zero. And that gives the functionality of what is called non-volatile computer memory. Meaning even if you switch off the electric power to this material, the dipole moment is spontaneously present and it can retain the memory. Non-volatile means even if you switch off power, the device can store the memory. So behind these technological properties, there's also very interesting science of materials and properties which are tunable by electric field and space. And these materials are very sensitive to boundary conditions, that is surroundings. You know That's why um, although these materials are like electrical analog of magnets, all of us have seen magnets in school days uh, as something we play with for experiments, but ferroelectrics are not so common. And that's because they are very sensitive to boundary conditions and surroundings around them. Behind these technological properties, the fundamental science comes from this, uh, something called as ferroelectric transition as shown here. If you increase temperature of a ferroelectric material, just like a magnet passes through Curie temperature, at high temperature, this phase is called as paraelectric phase. And this is an example of barium or lead titanate where at high temperature, the crystal structure is cubic, beautiful structure called cubic perovskite structure, where the center atom is titanium surrounded by six oxygen atoms inside a cube of barium atoms. And this is a unit which keeps repeating in all three directions, okay? As you cool this crystal down, it breaks symmetry. And this is a very fundamental concept in physics, basically breaking of symmetry at a phase transition. And in the context of barium titanate, it breaks inversion symmetry. Inversion means if you reverse spatial coordinate R to minus R, the uh, if the system remains the same, like here, it's called centrosymmetric crystal. Whereas this low temperature phase is non-centrosymmetric. And this breaking of inversion symmetry occurs by displacement of this positively charged titanium atom away from its centrosymmetric position, okay? And that gives you electric dipole moment. And this is the spontaneous dipole moment, just like a magnet has a magnetic moment present in a ferroelectric at low temperatures. And this displacement is accompanied by change in the unit cell shape. It becomes tetragonal unit cell, for example, giving you a different C and A parameter of the crystal. 
okay so why is this phase transition important because the functional properties that i told you in the last slide are present and possible only in the low temperature phase this is called ferroelectric phase and this is called paraelectric phase and functional properties are basically emergent properties which arise as a consequence of this broken inversion symmetry in the low temperature phase so linear piezoelectric constant i mentioned basically means if you apply electric field it changes the lattice constant and vice versa and non linear hysteresis basically means if you apply large enough electric field the polarization dipole moment can switch from up to down means this titanium atom is shifted up in this positive dipole moment case and if the same positive charge drops down you get a negative polarization or dipole moment and this can be done by applied electric field this curve is called hysteresis curve the linear piezoelectric property is what governs technological applications of sensing actuation micro electromechanical systems speakers and sonars and a number of other applications and non linear hysteresis is what is responsible for use of these materials in memory application and the transition is very important because near this phase transition you get very large colossal piezo, piezo and dielectric properties and instability of titanium of centering meaning this titanium atom get going away from its center is very important to these properties so the physics of this phone, uh, crystals is basically in vibrations this titanium atom when it goes up and down it's basically its vibrational motion and if you think of it in using quantum physical ideas they are also called as phonons so ferroelectricity in these type of oxide materials arise from uh, vibrations and phonons which basically involve rattling of titanium atom okay very nice so what is unusual and interesting scientifically about this uh, charge is you know if you think of titanium as a charged ion its nominal charge is 4 plus because it has two s electron and two d electron if you ionize it you get plus 4 charge but you know when you shift titanium atom and create a dipole moment and calculate this effective charge it's actually 7.5 this is first very unusual property of these oxides which make them ferroelectric or if you apply electric field the force which is felt by this positive charge as arising from this electric field is a charge times electric field which you know from high school electrostatics but that charge happens to be 7.5 not plus 4 and this anomalous charge it's called born defective charge is an indicator that this material will be ferroelectric okay and this uh, anomalous charge also gives rise to a very interesting effect called as longitudinal op optical and transverse optical phonon splitting and this splitting basically means that if you have transverse electromagnetic wave passing through this material uh, its frequency is here and if you it's basically ir frequency and if you have a longitudinal field it gives rise to anomalous splitting and that's called as lto splitting so these are vibrational waves which are longitudinal and these are transverse and these are the one waves which will couple with ir radiation and this material can be used for ir sensing as well and applications in ir spectroscopy so you will be wondering why if you are a chemist in the audience or physicist you will ask where does this anomalous charge come from and that's probably very important to ferroelectricity in these oxides so what we showed using our calculations and theory is this is paraelectric phase of barium titanate and this is ferroelectric phase of barium titanate and in the bottom i am showing you barium zirconate barium zirconate remains paraelectric down to 0 kelvin okay so that's why i'm showing you two materials which contrast between ferroelectric and not ferroelectric material in barium titanate you will see you have p orbital of oxygen as shown here which hybridizes with d orbital of titanium and uh, this is the cubic phase and if once you have a ferroelectric dipole moment a little amount of charge from right titanium atom displaces to the left titanium atom as you see there is no more d charge left and here is extra electronic charge and this is called as charge transfer 
And if you look at the Bohr effective charge, which I told you is very anomalous in barium titanate, most of it comes from this charge transfer. And in barium zirconite, which is not ferroelectric, you get a charge, much smaller charge transfer. Okay, so what electronic origin of ferroelectricity in this uh, uh, oxide perovskites is basically uh, hopping of electronic charge from one d orbital uh, of titanium to d orbital of another neighboring titanium atom, hopping through this oxygen atom. Some of you may be familiar with magnets, and in magnets also similar thing happens, but these electron which hops in magnet is having a spin. Whereas in this case, there is spin is zero and you have basically a charge hopping. And that it's, that, that's why it's similar to what is called as double exchange, okay? So this is the electronic origin of ferroelectricity in this important class of oxide ferroelectric materials. Bond effective charge is also anomalous in this other interesting material, particularly late telluride or germanium telluride. And here also, it indicates that these materials can be ferroelectric. And in fact, germanium telluride is one of the simplest materials to exhibit ferroelectricity. And it also has a very anomalous bond effective charge of about nine, whereas germanium charge is four plus. And the origin of it actually is also involves vicinity to metallic state and also the fact that germanium is two plus and it has a lone pair of electrons in 5s orbital, which plays an important role, okay? So this was an introduction to ferroelectrics in three dimensions. Now, you know, we, want, we are interested in ferroelectricity at nanoscale because one would want to develop very high density devices and integrated circuits from ferroelectric materials. By the way, if there is any question, please do stop me during my talk. I'll be happy to take any questions at any time. Okay, so what happens to ferroelectricity if the thickness of a ferroelectric film becomes extremely small on the scale of few nanometers? And that is something which is very interesting, involves physics, which is very simple, because if you have a slab of ferroelectric like this with an electric polarization which is pointing up, yes, any questions? Yeah, okay, I'll continue. Uh, if it has a up dipole moment, it gives rise to what are called as bound surface charges. As a, this is high school physics again. And these surface charges give rise to depolarizing field, which opposes the dipole moment. And this depolarizing field will like to suppress this spontaneous polarization in ferroelectric and kill ferroelectricity at nanoscale. So the question is, is there a lower limit on thickness of a ferroelectric film below which one cannot have ferroelectric properties? Well, in real applications, a ferroelectric slab is always surrounded by a metal electrode as shown here. And metal electrodes have, all of you know, free electrons in them, which carry electricity, right? So moment you have a dipole moment in a ferroelectric film, uh, electrode, has free electrons which get attracted to the positive surface charges of a ferroelectric. And on the opposite side, electrons get repelled and you get a positive uh, layer of positive charges inside a ferroelectric in some thickness, narrow thickness of inside the sur below surface of the metal electrode. And these charges, as you will see, compensate for these surface charges in the electric field, right? These positive charges will be canceled by negative charges in the metal side. And as a result, depolarizing field will suppress. And what it means is, if you have electrodes which are sandwiching a ferroelectric film in a device, electrodes will actually support survival of ferroelectricity at nanoscale films. So that's the interesting thing. You know, when you work in nanoscale devices, properties depend not just on the material used in making the device, but also what is interfacing with that device, which electrode you use. Sorry. Indeed, this was done, shown in 2004 in the, by an argon group in science paper, uh, where they looked at ferroelectricity as a function of film thickness, and they showed that the ferroelectric transition temperature drops rather sharply when the thickness goes to few nanometers. Okay. And what they also showed using electron microscopy is 
uh, you get basically stable, stable domain structure where polarization is dipole is up and down, forming what are called a stripe-like domain structure in a nanoscale ferroelectric film. My group did molecular dynamic simulations to understand why this happens. And our simulations basically included a ferroelectric slab shown here with local electric atomic scale dipoles, which I introduced to you earlier, basically titanium atoms, surrounded by two metal electrodes as shown here. What we showed was very interesting. If you have a very good, perfect metallic electrode, the ferroelectric transition temperature remains high and it basically drops gradually when the unit cell thickness comes below 40 angstrom or 4 nanometer, then the ferroelectric transition temperature drops. But then we showed that if the metal electrode is not good, that's bare metal electrode, you kill ferroelectricity. In fact, what we showed is the phase transition occurs from paraelectric phase to a ferroelectric domain phase, meaning you have a thin film which will have up and down domains, exactly what was shown experimentally in 2004. And the reason for it is if you have a bare metal electrode, it cannot suppress the depolarizing field, which gives rise to stabilization of this domain structure, okay? And if you have a domain structure like this, indeed, the smart functionality of ferroelectric field will certainly change at nanoscale. So that prompts us, can we take this two-dimensional, uh, sorry, the thickness limit of ferroelectrics to the ultimate level? And that's why ferroelectricity in 2D materials is an important, interesting subject scientifically. The reason is it has a lot of potential for applications. It will have smart functionality. It will uh, combine and memory capability, and it will be combined with semiconducting electronic properties, which are also possible in 2D material, which Dr. Latte may talk about. Uh, the second aspect of this is fundamental science, because as I explained, ferroelectricity at nanoscale is an interesting fundamental question. And the specific question we want to ask is, can ferroelectricity with out-of-plane polarization exist in 2D? And you will, what I will convince you is actually electrons and phonons couple very strongly in 2D materials and that make it possible to have dipolar moment even in two dimensional materials, okay? So first let me tell you what electron phonon coupling is and why it is very interesting and useful. Uh, those of you who, have, who are familiar with superconductors are probably already aware that electron phonon coupling is what is responsible for superconductivity in materials, which is of course Another functionality, which is very powerful and useful in number of applications. Electron phonon coupling also has interesting consequences in 2D materials. So what is electron phonon coupling means if you have an electron which is moving inside your crystal and there is a vibrational wave which is passing by, they two collide with each other and scatter away from each other. Okay, this is the consequence of coupling. And this coupling becomes even more important in two-dimensional materials. And this is example of conducting polymer. It's taken from this website in the Nobel Prize. You will see when an electron moves from one side to another in this polyacetylene, the double bond goes from one side to another, you can see. And when the double bond becomes single bond, there is a change in the bond length and that's basically the vibration of this uh, one-dimensional crystal. And also people have shown in uh, 2013 that in two-dimensional materials, uh, phonons like this and electrons are so strongly <laughs> coupled together that you cannot even isolate uh, them from each other. In graphene, which is one of the most important uh, two-dimensional material, uh, electron phonon coupling results in change in the vibrational frequency of that material. When you dope that graphene with electron carriers. And you know, all of you, uh, I mean, some of you may be familiar with the field effect transistor. If you make a FET from graphene, you know, you have source electrode, you have drain electrode, and this in here is a graphene channel which connects source and drain electrodes. And you may have a gate electrode at the bottom of it, which will, if, if you apply gate voltage, you will change the number of electrons in graphene. That's called doping in graphene uh, or tuning electron concentration in graphene. Now, you know, if you have a 2D graphene uh, material, it's very difficult to characterize 
uh, it at atomic scale. How many electron carriers does it have? How will you measure it in a lab? You know, so that's where uh, this electron phonon coupling becomes useful. And here is a proposal that you can use Raman spectroscopy, which is a non-invasive tool. Means what, what one does is it sh one shines light onto this graphene channel and the vibrations of graphene changes the color of this light wave and it, the scattered light has a different color and change in the color basically means change in the frequency of light and that gives you the vibrational frequency. And what was shown is if you change the number of carriers in graphene, its vibrational frequency changes because of the electron phonon coupling. And then you can use Raman spectroscopy to measure electron concentration or carrier concentration in graphene. Okay. And this was shown in molybdenum sulfide also, another very important two-dimensional material where you know you shine light with a frequency omega L and measure a scattered light with the fre change frequency to omega s and changes this frequency basically depends on number of carriers which are present in this two-dimensional MOS2 channel in a field effect transistor which can be tuned using gate electrode. Okay. So electron phonon coupling is very important in 2D materials in even characterization of a field effect transistor possibly. Okay. So what we want to say is what is the relevance can we explore ferroelectricity in two-dimensional materials uh, using what is called as first principle theory? Um, and my research is all based on first principle theory and computer simulation. So I will just give you one very brief introduction uh, to one slide introduction to this because of uh, limitation of time. Uh, but I, the reason I want to tell you about this theory is uh, this type of theory and simulations can be carried out on even a PC. So if you have a reasonable personal computer or even a laptop with you, you can do this type of research even in a small college uh, or uh, where you know other resources may not be available for sophisticated experimental research work. So th that's another, if I have to tell you about this methodology that will be a separate talk, but I want to just sort of advertise to you, particularly from the new college in uh, Parner, that if you have some simple computers, you can use them to do this type of research. So these computer simulations simulate a material as a soup of nuclei and electrons. Uh, and electrons are treated using quantum physics and nuclei are treated using Newton's laws of classical motion. And electrons basically are in the quantum ground state. And that simulation is what takes a lot of time. And once you do this quantum mechanical calculation, you can obtain Basically, this type of figures, which you may have used in classes to tell your students what type of bonding exists in the material as well or molecules. And this total energy function that comes out, total energy of a collection of electrons and nuclei, is basically the interact atomic interaction potential. And that's a very powerful concept uh, and can be simulated on a reasonable resources. And Walter Kahn, who developed this density functional theory, received a Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1998. So all the work I will talk about now in the next slides is based on this type of simulations, okay? And they can be easily done on even a small computer you may have with you. So I, let me talk about uh, 2D man materials, particularly transition metal chalcogenides. They can occur in two structures. One is basically two-edge structure where, you know, this is the top view and this is the side view, and this is MOS2. And this second structure is called 1T structure. It is centrosymmetric. So you, you will expect that this may have a dipole moment and this may not have a dipole moment. And this is the side view of it. Um, you know, the changing crystal structure results in totally uh, drastic changes in their electronic properties. And this is the way to understand it. You know, uh, in MOS2, there are uh, D electrons remaining on molybdenum atom, 2D electrons. And you see, because in 2 H structure, molybdenum atom is surrounded by six selenium sulfur atoms in a prismatic manner, the d orbitals of molybdenum, 5D orbitals of molybdenum split like this because of the crystal field. And in 1T structure, it's octahedral means you have six sulfur atoms, which are octahedrally surrounding metal. And because the electrostatic field of this uh, crystal is different, you get degeneracies of T2G and EG orbitals here. As a result, 2H structure that I showed here 
is semiconducting and 1t structure is metallic because you know here you have uh, three d orbitals and only two electrons in each transition metal atom indeed if we de do calculation of electronic structure 2h structure has uh, semiconducting electronic bands where conduction band is separated by a gap of 1.8 eV from valence band where electrons are occupying these states. On the other hand, 1T structure is metallic, as I explained to you earlier. And because this is a metallic structure in 2D and which has many electronic states at the Fermi energy, uh, this structure is likely to be unstable, meaning it will not be energetically happy to be in this structure. And that's what we show that if you look at what is called as a Fermi surface of this 2D 1T structure, which is centrosymmetric, which has nesting, you know, it has a triangular packets of Fermi surface, means electronic states inside these are occupied and outside these are unoccupied. So any phonon or wave structural change, which has a wave vector, which is given by this red arrow, that will lead to changes in the crystal structure to lower its symmetry and energy. And what we showed is basically, indeed, uh, the energy of the centrosymmetric 1T structure can be lowered, and you get this lower energy structure, which involves trimerization, okay? Uh, so 1T structure distorts, and three molybdenum atoms near each other form bonds with each other. And you see these blue lines indicate the bonding between nearest neighbor titanium and the molybdenum atoms. And that is the low energy structure in comparison with a high symmetry structure. And then you will ask what happens to electronic structure? Well, it, this was metallic, but moment you give rise to this trimerization of molybdenum atoms, it becomes semiconducting, okay? And this is the very strong evidence that electrons and phonons in MOS2 couple very strongly, and they open up the band gap. And indeed, the vibrational spectrum of this 1T structure shows that it's also stable. What happens to inversion symmetry? If you look at electron density difference between distorted 1T structure, this is the trimerized 1T structure and centrosymmetric 1T structure, you will see that electric charge, electronic charge is, break, is breaking the reflection symmetry. What it means is, one will have electric dipole moment, which is perpendicular to the plane no, of no, no, no. 2D material. And indeed, we verify that. So where does that polarization come from? There is very interesting mathematical theory, which I won't go into detail. Uh, but what we show is uh, 1T MOS2, this is the simple picture that we derive from our simulations, is a semiconductor, and which, which means that it has three electrons. But these free electrons strongly coupled with electric dipoles, which are perpendicular to the 1T slab. This is two-dimensional sheet of MOS2. And as a result, you can control electronic motion by applying electric field, which will control this perpendicular dipole moments. Using this concept, we proposed a new type of devices uh, for applications called dipole electronic devices, where you know, you can have electric dipole moment in 1T MOS2 up and down. And if you uh, imagine this, this is called as a dipolar domain wall. And if you calculate the electrostatic potential as a function of this coordinate, which goes, passes through the dipolar domain wall, you get a large energy barrier. It's like a speed breaker, you know? So what it means is if you can engineer this dipolar domain structure in the two-dimensional MOS2, you will be able to control the motion of electrons. You can create speed breaker by applying electric field, basically, okay? Using this idea, we propose that this device, which is like a field effect transistor, but it has three gate electrodes. This is called as an offset gate electrode, and these two are control gate electrodes. You can develop within this simple device a NAND gate capability, okay? Within sim single field effect transistor like device. And if you ask uh, electrical engineer uh, who expertise, whose expertise is in digital circuits, if you have NAND gate, you can basically develop any logic circuit using such a small device. So based on this, you know, using this fundamental science that I told you, we are now able to propose that new type of device technology, which will have very high density and low power uh, logic devices possible, all right? So let me, uh, is MOS2 unique? Well, there are many other transition metal dichalcogenides, but our calculations suggest 
that only MOS2 is special. Other compounds like molybdenum selenide or tungsten selenide or sulfide, they don't show this ferroelectric phase as I, as I showed you here, okay? So MOS2 is very unique. What about experiment? Until now, everything was based on simulations. Just around the same time our paper was published, there was also a paper in Nature Nanotechnology which showed atomistic mechanism to stabilize this 1T structure. You know, these are, this green region is basically the 1T structure of MOS2. And we are now hoping that experimentalists will be able to verify the prediction that we have that strong electron phone uncoupling gives rise to semiconductor to metal transition in MOS2 uh, thanks to electron phone uncoupling. And what we have shown at a, as a fundamental science is electron phone uncoupling was known to be responsible for superconductivity and charge density waves long ago. But now we show that electron phone uncoupling can also give you ferroelectricity, particularly in two dimensions where it is not otherwise possible due to depolarizing field. Okay, so this is a sort of uh, introduction to two-dimensional ferroelectricity. Followed by this work, there were many recent developments where people started looking for 2D materials which may exhibit ferroelectricity. So one of the materials which came up recently in science is basically tin selenide, okay? And they prepared, synthesized one atomically thin layer of tin telluride as shown here. And what they showed is this ultra thin film of tin telluride grown on graphene layer on top of silicon uh, carbide exhibits ferroelectricity, but with in-plane electric dipole, okay? So the dipole moment here is within the plane as you, you shown here in the picture in this micrograph, okay? So, uh, and in this case, of course, electron phone uncoupling is also strong. So there is likely to be, um, uh, distortions like I described here. Followed by this, there were other works on phosphorine, which was shown to be ferroelastic, means if you stretch phosphorine in these two direction, phosphorine, by the way, is graphene-like sheet of phosphorus atoms, okay? With a different structure, it doesn't have hexagonal structure, it has orthorhombic structure. And if you expand it, you can change its crystal structure, giving rise to in-plane dipole moment. And that's what led to other works, which showed that tin telluride or uh, germanium uh, selenide and sulfide can also be ferroelectric in this two-dimensional form where you apply stress and you can change from one dipole moment to another dipole moment as shown here, okay? So this was work uh, followed by our, uh, that followed up our discovery of 2D ferroelectricity. Then there are a number of other works which showed, and this is a review article uh, which shows that in two dimensions, you know, if you make 2D film of oxides, which I talked about initially, there is a size limit. You cannot have polarization below thickness of 2.4 nanometer or 1.2 nanometer. But uh, if you go for complicated 2D materials, you can get in-plane polar polarization as well, or out-of-plane polarization in MOS2 that I told you, or you, you can have this uh, more complex chalcogenides. So as of now, the world record of two-dimensional ferroelectrics uh, at that time was half a nanometer in the material that we predicted from first principles, 1T MOS2. That prompted us to ask question, can there be another two-dimensional material which exhibits ferroelectricity with perpendicular polar dipole moment, okay? So that led us to think about this material called hexagonal niobium nitride, which we had predicted using uh, this type of quantum mechanical simulations on the computer, where we showed that niobium nitride is a two-dimensional form is a very interesting material, okay? And again, I won't go into details of it, uh, but it's a semiconductor, which is very similar to MOS2, and which has a excellent optical property, so you can use it uh, in solar energy conversion. Its conduction band and valence band are also at energies where they can easily facilitate reduction of oxidation of water. And what it means is this 2D niobium nitride is suitable for photocatalytic splitting of water. Some of you may be interested in these properties. But more importantly, we showed that this two-dimensional niobium nitride 
have a very large gap in the vibrational spectrum. What it means is, even if you heat up this material, it creates a lot of vibrational thermal motion, but they don't decay off into acoustic wave. And you can, as a result, use it in hot carrier solar cell application. So the same two-dimensional material we showed has functionality to do solar splitting of water. And also you can use it for photovoltaic solar cells. Then the question we asked is, can we make it ferroelectric? And you know, this is the example where computer simulations can play a very powerful role in exploring new functionalities and properties in material which you already have with you. So that's what we led us to this work, where we asked, well, if you look at the side view of niobium nitride, you have positive charges of niobium, negative charges of nitrogen. So naturally you have a dipole moment, electric dipole moment, which is perpendicular to it, okay? But unfortunately, uh, niobium and nitrogen are so widely separated, you know, this uh, distance uh, between, Z distance between niobium and nitrogen is very large, 0.78 angstrom. As a result, although it has a dipole moment, you cannot switch it because it's too large a change in the structure to be introduced by electric field. So a very intuitive question we asked is, if we stretch this niobium nitride in the two direction, then it will become flat, planar, right? That's what we showed that if you stretch niobium nitride, that is called uh, straining niobium nitride uh, in by percentage, like 5%, you can stabilize what is called as a planar structure. So planar structure has zero dipole moment. So then we got an idea that if we can work in the neighborhood of this uh, buckle to planar transition, we can probably explore ferroelectricity in hexagonal niobium nitride. And that's what we did. We looked at the first electric dipole moment and as a function of strain. And what we found to our surprise was the dipole moment changes its sign, even if the buckling, buckling is basically this delta niobium above nitrogen, doesn't change its size. And that was a very interesting result, which meant that electric dipole moment in niobium nitride may be switchable and originate from electronic uh, type of polarizability. Okay, so I'll skip this slide. So what we did then is we looked at energy of hexagonal niobium nitride as a function of buckling. And you see, this is a buckle structure, buckle structure, and you have a flat structure, which is higher in energy. Okay, and then we asked a question, can we now apply electric field to switch the structure or dipole moment of niobium nitride from this well to this well to this well? And indeed, that's what we find from our simulation. If you apply electric field, you start with this niobium nitride with a negative electric field. And if you apply opposite electric field, it first switches to the flat structure, in this picture, it goes to this energy well. From here, it hops to here. And then with further electric field in the opposite direction, it flips to the opposite side, okay? So what it means is not only a hexagonal niobium nitride is ferroelectric, but it will allow you to have three level logic, which is quite important to new type of electronic devices where you, know, you can develop neuromorphic devices, for example, where you have three state structure of niobium nitride which can be utilized. We looked at electric dipole moment as a function of electric field, and it shows interesting hysteresis that I talked about earlier. And I won't again go into details. Uh, so again, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll skip this and show that uh, hexagonal in two dimensional materials, uh, ferroelectricity can exist and very crucial to this ferroelectricity is a strong coupling between electrons and phonons. So the take home message is unlike oxides, which I talked about earlier in the introduction where phonons were the primary players in giving rise to ferroelectricity, in 2D materials, electrons and phonons partner together very interesting way to give rise to ferroelectricity in 2D, okay? So I will now go come to the final part of my talk and Basically, that's the most exciting development, uh, at least from my group and my collaborator in Korea. Basically, we showed that hafnium oxide is uh, ferroelectric, okay? And not only hafnium oxide is ferroelectric, it exhibits both nano and bulk ferroelectricity. It contains two-dimensional sheets of in-plane ferroelectric dipoles 
which are stacked in the perpendicular direction to give three-dimensional crystal structure. Hafnium oxide occurs in this fluorite-based crystal structure, where uh, you can see these are oxygen atoms, uh, I, and these are hafnium atoms. We have colored oxygen atoms in two parts. Blue means they have shifted up, and red means they have shifted down. Okay. The reason why it is a very exciting discovery is uh, hafnium oxide is already part of semiconductor technology. And if you can grow it in a nice way in silicon, which is already possible, you can easily integrate it uh, with and develop ultimately high density memory devices within existing fabrication technology, okay? So this is something we are very excited about. And I'll tell you now what the interesting science behind it is. So this is the structural origin of ferroelectricity. If you look at vibrational spectrum of cubic hafnium oxide, there are no unstable mode at gamma points. So you can't expect ferroelectricity in normal hafnium oxide. But there are other phonons which are unstable. These are basically phonons which involves displacement of one plane of oxygen atoms down and another plane of oxygen atoms up. Okay, so this unstable mode basically means you have dipole moment coming in one direction in this plane and opposite direction in the other plane. These are similar to antiferromagnet or antiferroelectric type of a material. And this particular phonon is called as antipolar phonon, means uh, dipole moment coming from different oxygen atoms are in opposite direction. Okay, and this particular phonon basically involves oxygen atom displacements together, parallel to each other, and they will give rise to a dipole moment everywhere in the crystal. But what is unique about hafnium oxide is this beautiful thing that these two vibrations or displacement of oxygen sublattices occur in equal amounts. Okay, this is the magic of hafnium oxide, that polar phonon and antipolar phonon condense in equal amplitude to give you ferroelectric phase. You know, if you add up these arrows, you will find that in the blue one, there will be zero displacement of oxygen atoms. And in the red color, oxygen atoms will be shifting down or up, right? So this gives rise to dipole moment, which is up and down. In this zone, the dipole moment is up. And in this case, the dipole moment is zero, okay? So you get alternating two-dimensional sheets of spacer layer, which has zero dipole moment and non-zero dipole moment uh, type of ferroelectric. And most interestingly, unlike other compounds I talked about, in this case, the ferroelectricity is anionic, meaning it comes from negatively charged ions in the system, namely oxygen and ions, okay? And this, by the way, is a very spectacular finding that three-dimensional crystal architecture of hafnium oxide gives rise to two-dimensional ferroelectric sheets. And not only two-dimensional ferroelectric sheet, they are beautifully separated from, from each other by this dead layer or what is called as a spacer layer. And that is what we are most excited about because now, you know, we won't be worrying about fabricating an extremely small hafnium oxide because even if you have a three-dimensional uh, or wider structure of hafnium oxide, you have access to nanoscale devices possible. What is another spectacular aspect of uh, hafnium oxide is you can have these electric dipole moments and their domain structure. See, up in this half of hafnium oxide, you have dipole moment, which is up. And in this half, dipole moment is down. And this is called as a domain wall, which separates domain of up polarization from domain of down polarization. I'm showing you here the, on the bottom domain, similar domain wall in lead titan. And you will see in late titanate, the domain wall is very diffused and there is no sort of dipole moment gets suppressed near the domain wall. So what is fascinating about hafnium oxide in contrast to oxide ferroelectrics is uh, the domain walls have zero thickness. You know, the dipole moment flips from up to down with basically one change in the unit cell. And it has zero energy, which you will see in the next slide uh, in contrast to late titanate. So that opens up really amazing possibilities. You see, I can flip this dipole moment in only one two-dimensional sheet. And you know, you, I can go from 
homogeneously polarized state, ferroelectric state given by this picture to one in which one unit cell is flipped. And in this case, two layers of half, uh, ferroelectric dipole are flipped and they all have roughly the same energy. See, this has same energy as this and same as this. So you can stabilize any domain structure with no energy cost, except for the fact that you have a large energy barrier to cross. On the positive note, this large energy barrier is very good to stabilize this domain structure and store memory in these devices or material. But it, large domain barrier, switching barrier also means that you need large electric fields to switch, unfortunately. In contrast, I'm showing you here lead titanate. You know, if you flip only one dipole moment, unit cell dipole of lead titanate, you don't get a stable unit cell at all. And when you start flipping, you see there is no barrier. So the domain grows indefinitely. Meaning in normal ferroelectrics like lead titanate, you can't have nanoscale domains easily. Whereas in hafnium oxide, they are all stable at any scale. Okay, and that's why we called it as scale-free ferroelectricity in hafnium oxide, which means you can switch dipole moment at any length scale that you like. And that's shown here. This is called as activation electric field and coercive electric field or switching electric field. All perovskite oxide or other ferroelectrics fall in this curve where activation field is much larger than coercive field because the dipole moment on many domain structure, whereas in hafnium oxide, they have a slope one. And that was a very big, interesting puzzle in the literature. And our work also answers that question. So what I have shown is in this last piece of work, not only simulations were useful in predicting new type of ferroelectricity called scale-free ferroelectricity in hafnium oxide, uh, it was also able to explain the ex puzzle in existing experiment in hafnium oxide, basically that you can have scale-free dipole switching. And as a result, what we predict is you can have devices where you know the thickness of a device will be limited by which electrode you use. And you can have really ult ultimately high density storage devices in hafnium oxide. And these are some proposals we have. Uh, this is the ideal thing we can propose where you know you can have a memory bit whose width is about half a nanometer or one nanometer, but that's going to be very difficult because you can't really deposit metal electrodes or wires, which are that thin. In practical sense, you will end up having few nanometer wide uh, deposition of metal electrode. You see the below it, hafnium oxide, which can be bulk also because the dead layer will already take care of separation between different memory bits. And that opens up really new type of device technology. So my time is almost getting over. I will summarize my talk. Uh, I first introduced to you two ferroelectric crystals in three dimensions. They have spontaneous electric dipoles which respond to external stress and electric fields. And as a result, they are very sensitive to surrounding and hence interesting at nanoscale. Then I showed you that it's possible to have two dimensional ferroelectric materials with the two examples given here. They were predicted using simulation with my group and we hope uh, they, will op they opened up a new field of two dimensional ferroelectricity. And here the origin is coming from combination of electrons and phonons enabling new type of devices called dipole electronic devices. Then in the last part, I talked about a really new flavor of ferroelectricity called scale-free ferroelectricity in a material which is already part of semiconductor technology. So we are very excited about this last stage where two-dimensional ferroelectric sheets will allow you to have ultimately high density computer memories. Uh, I will acknowledge the people with whom I have done this work uh, postdoc Anuja, then PhD students who worked with my group over the last 10 to 15 years, and also the group in Korea with whom I collaborated in on hafnium oxide work, and some of the experiments were done by Ajay Sud's work in uh, on graphene and MOS2. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm, I'll be happy to interact and take questions or receive comments from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much for your detailed discussion on advanced functional materials, particularly ferroelectric materials. Uh, this lecture may helpful for new young researchers who 
who want to do the research in the material chemistry material science uh, thank you very much sir uh, if anybody have any questions regarding the uh, topic you may ask i, I have a question can i ask yes sir krupana ji speak can i ask a small question yes please umesh as usual excellent lecture fantastic talk thank you in the in the part of the stain induced and phase transition yes indium niobium nitride yes do you also see any time dependence uh, uh professor kupani as of now we haven't done any uh, time dependent uh, studies or simulations uh -huh. uh, but that's an interesting suggestion you know we are big particularly because it has both electrons and phonons together they may show right. very uh, interesting dynamics and so we should look at that thank you for your okay. comment all right thank you so much I appreciate that okay. Yes, Doctor Kai, you had some. Yeah, Umesh, uh, uh, you are just talk about the uh, hot carrier solar cells, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So these two D materials uh, are we are are we going to use in this um, uh, hot carrier solar cell or quantum dots? Uh, yeah. So what we proposed is uh, hexagonal niobium nitride, even in the uh, unstrained form, like honeycomb mm. like this. It has not only excellent optical absorption properties, but it is also very uh, interesting in its vibrational spectrum. So uh, the reason we say it is useful for hot carrier solar cells is, you know, the, the limitation on efficiency of a solar cell comes from the fact that much of the solar energy gets dissipated into vibration, thermal motion. You know, the if you have low efficiency, it means energy is getting dissipated in some form, and it's typically Uh, the excited electrons by light lose their energy to vibrate. And uh, what niobium nitride is known, we have shown is it has a vibrational properties which don't allow it to get rid of that heat. You know, it's called Clement's decay is not possible. So as a result, we believe that even in high temperature hot carrier solar cells, um, this material will be quite useful in maintaining high efficiency. So it's a prediction as of now. Uh, unfortunately, it means first one will have to synthesize this material in the lab and then uh, consider it for application in a hot carrier solar cell. And this is this is regarding again neutron energy capture. Yes. Sir. So now people are talking about neutron energy, and uh, we are also started working on neutron energy capture materials like. I see. Materials. Okay. So. So, so we can to have we are going to have cluster on uh, um, this neutron energy. Okay. Right. So I think India there is no cluster. Only people are talking about uh, the uh, uh, little theoretical model. So whether we can make a group of it of neutron energy, uh, it's, you are you can do that theoretical modeling and all these things. Hmm? Sure. sure. So yes. Doctor Bhatkar is uh, interested in that. Okay. so uh, they want to uh, make a group and uh, uh, give some funding to this group okay so people can work uh, together on uh, this uh, okay. energy and uh, also there is a german group associated with it uh, a energy group in germany so they have also shown interest to participate in this so that will be exciting i think i think we should also take uh, up, um, advantage of this opportunity and come together so i'm just writing to all people hmm? sure. and, uh, make uh, we'll have some one webinar also yeah. on the same uh, because people from chennai and um, two people working in Al aligarh university they have book uh, written a book chapter on this little right. so let us see what we have what our people have done and uh, the three people from the german uh, scientists what they have done so that we can just check out the program is it Thank fine you. yes i'll be happy to be a part of the group and i again thank you very much dr kai for giving me opportunity to be here and thank interact you, with all the we are our people are very proud of you because you have that have that kind of uh, work you are doing international level and so everybody is happy that you are here today okay. thank you thank you professor varma sir thank you uh, being a part here and uh, become a part of this workshop
now we are waiting for the next session of uh, professor rahul panath i would like to firstly uh, to introduce professor rahul panath sir professor rahul panath sir is a presently professor at department of mechanical engineering carnegie mellon university pittsburgh usa and has a huge experience in research and development of advanced additive manufacturing for structural materials biomedical devices flexible microelectronics advanced energy materials physical and chemical sensors i would like to say few words about his academics he has completed his bs mechanical engineering in pune uh, pune university india in 1993 to 297 Uh, ms mechanical engineering university of massachusetts at usa uh, from 97 to 99 and he has been completed his phd in theoretical and applied mechanics from university of illinois urbana usa uh, he has more than 75 papers in well reputed international journals and has more than 10 patents Sir has received more than 4.8 million dollars funds from different funding agencies for the project. Sir has visited many countries and delivered lectures in more than 40 national and international conferences. Due to his work in the field of research, he got many awards and recognitions. Few of them are Strominger Teaching Fellowship Award in December 2019, Divisional Award by Intel for outstanding efforts in the development, and this award. Sir has got continuously from 2007 to 2010. Lin Six Sigma Green Belt Certification Award at Intel in 2014. Henry L. Lenga Graduate Award, University of Illinois at Urbana. Sir got the <coughs> gold medal of Material Research Society of India in 2010. and mavis memorial fund scholarship award university of illinois illinois at urbana in 2002 and 2003 uh, and he also got research fellowship of university of illinois at urbana from 1999 to 2000 and sir has also received the national merit scholarship by the government of india in 1991 sir we are very thankful uh, for being here and delivering the lecture for us sir we are very grateful for accept accepting our invitations may i request you to start your session sir please sir okay uh, yeah thank you thank you dr dole um let me um share the screen uh, so can everyone see my screen yes sir yes sir okay okay yeah so yes, uh, okay so first of all thank you so much uh, um, dr kare for um, uh, the the kind invitation um, dr uh, tube and dr mahesh uh, as well as before the popel dr latte i also uh, have uh, i i also thank professor wagmare and professor uh, krupanidhi for for uh, being here and and sharing their work as well as dr latte so uh, let me start <coughs> let me start my talk just yeah okay so um uh, the the outline of my talk is as follows so this talk is slightly different than what what you heard before this is more engineering oriented and uh, focuses on 3d printing at uh, micro scales using nano materials and Uh, mainly focuses on devices how to make devices and and um how we can advance these for for betterment of of healthcare as well as um uh, creating high uh, uh, capacity energy materials so uh, first i'll talk about nanoparticle 3d printing technology which is these are very recent ad, uh, advancements and um these uh, fabrication techniques were just not available in the past so these have opened very very exciting possibilities um we'll i'll talk about 2d and 3d structures that are enabled by 3d printing 
And then I will talk about several devices. Uh, most of them are biomedical devices, such as brain computer interfaces, uh, biomedical decals for um, uh, in situ monitoring of uh, bio, uh, biomarkers, um, as well as temperature uh, sensors, and then detection of viral antibodies. I'll then talk about lithium ion batteries and conclusions and future direction of this exciting area of research. Um, so uh, uh, Dr. Dole did a great job in, in uh, discussing where I came from. So uh, with my background, so I don't need to go through this slide, but all I will mention is that I have very strong ties with Pune. I grew up in Pune. Uh, in fact, in Pune University campus, where my uh, my father was a faculty member, and uh, uh, later on went into different areas, but all related to ultimately manufacture uh, uh, mechanical engineering as well as uh, materials science. Uh, so since 2017, I have been at Carnegie Mellon University, and uh, my research is focused on nanoparticle-based fabrication methods. So. Uh, what is uh, additive manufacturing, uh, which is same as 3D printing? Um, so in very simple terms, right, for students, uh, additive manufacturing is, is adding material rather than taking it apart, uh, taking, uh, or, or, uh, taking material away to create a part. It is as simple as that. And the way additive manufacturing um, uh, is used to make parts is that you start with some kind of powders or, or nanoparticles or microparticles, and then fuse or sinter them together using some form of energy. Um, if the length scale of the structures you are making is greater than about one to five millimeters, um, the additive manufacturing methods are listed here and typically laser powder bed fusion, for example, or, or electron beam sintering um, are the key methods to make such parts. Subtractive or semi-additive methods are of course our traditional manufacturing methods like lathe, uh, drilling and milling and such, right? At micro scales, uh, which is 10 nanometers to about one millimeter, um, we use uh, the subtractive or semi-additive method is lithography, right? Um, and laser machining and, and such. But uh, additive methods are, are two photon lithographies, inkjet printing, aerosol jet printing, and, and extrusion printing. And I will, I will uh, uh, talk in detail about aerosol jet printing, which is what I have been working on at CMU. So uh, why additive manufacturing, right? So um, why can't I just go back and do um, traditional uh, semi-additive or subtractive manufacturing methods? So here are the key reasons behind that. So first of all, additive manufacturing enables uh, making of very, very complex geometries. And this includes 3D shapes, which is very difficult to make using lithography. Um, second one is introduction of new materials. So uh, there is no chemical compatibility here, right? Because we are starting with some kind of powders or particles and fusing them together. Ideally, one, I can mix any number of particles, right? And fuse them together and create my part. Um, the third important advantage is novel microstructures are uh, uh, possible. This is because if I start, for example, with na uh, nanoparticles and make a part, uh, each nanoparticle becomes a grain in itself. And then one can control the, uh, how the grain evolve um, as a function of time uh, based on this. Um, and uh, this is of course, additive manufacturing uh, creates minimal waste. So it's a, it's a more energy efficient method. And um, the other very big advantage in productization or developing a product, especially start for startup companies that are intensely using research concepts to create, create parts, they need very cheap way of making a part, which is um, enabled by 3D printing because rapid prototyping is, is possible. Again, uh, please interrupt me at any time if, if you have any questions and I'll be very, very happy to, um, happy to answer. Uh, so uh, printing of nano and microparticles um, is, is the, really the research area I'm going to talk about. 
And this consists of um, a very simple method of a direct write process in which the, the nanoparticles or microparticles, uh, which is dispersed in some kind of liquid is dispensed on a substrate and some form of energy, it could be thermal energy, it could be laser, it could be photonic energy um, that is um, used in order to fuse the particles together and remove the binders or other organic materials that might be um, here. Uh, if this is a polymer precursor, then uh, let's say a UV curable polymer, then UV can be flashed in order to um, cure the material. So the concept of micro and nanoparticle printing is not very complicated at all. It's a very simple thing. We, we take nanoparticles, we deposit them on a substrate and use some kind of thermal, some kind of uh, energy source to, to, to fuse the particles together. Um, so what are the um, additive methods, right? So one is inkjet printing that everybody knows, right? Our printer is an inkjet printer. Um, uh, there is extrusion printing where you just simply apply pressure to your functional material that you are dispensing. Um, the third one is uh, um, aerosol jet printing where you have a carrier gas that um, uh, creates a mist or, or a pressurized gas that can create a mist of droplets that contain the functional material and then that functional material is uh, carried by a gas and then you deposit at, uh, that at certain location and um, two photon lithography is another way where um, you would have um, um, beams of um, photons that, that intersect at certain point, giving enough energy for the polymer to um, cure and uh, by rastering this through the liquid volume or precursor volume, we can create additively a very, very complex and very, very accurately placed uh, structure with micrometer length scale accuracy. So um, people have used these methods in the past. So the first example on the left is called, was called dip pen nanolithography. Um, this was work published about 20 years ago where people could go at a location uh, pick up some molecules and place them at nanometer precision. Um, this uh, method really never got commercialized because um, the, the speed of writing was, was extremely small uh, for any practical use. Uh, there is extrusion pen type of uh, 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 printing, which is a group at Harvard that is working on this to create these interdigitated batteries. And then using inkjet printing, we can print on some um, substrate to again, create uh, uh, components such as passives. So uh, the, the printing method that we, are, we have been using at uh, Carnegie Mellon University is called aerosol jet 3D printing. In this method, we uh, uh, use either ultrasonic energy or pressurized gas to um, um, convert nanoparticle ink into a mist of droplets. And each of these droplets is about one to five microns in diameter, uh, each containing nanoparticles, which are um, anywhere between three to 30 or uh, 50 nanometers in, in uh, size. And then these droplets are focused on a, um, on a substrate uh, at a scale of around 10 micrometers. So um, starting from the mist here, uh, we can deposit the structure on any given substrate. Um, so this is a video I'm going to play and the comet like thing that you see here is um, nanoparticles uh, that are getting printed on a substrate. And uh, 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 you will see later that there will be a laser beam that comes in and centers these nanoparticles to create um, this electronic circuit in the time that we saw this video, right? So you can see now the laser beam is, is uh, centering this, these lines and um, uh, creating a continuous uh, conducting line on a two dimensional surface. So does everybody uh, see the video?
Yeah, you can see that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. Great. Okay. So, um, so, so the idea is that extremely um, fast uh, way of prototyping or creating uh, structures and electronic lines is possible with this. So this is great, right? This is um, excellent capability, but then how I ca can I use it to do my research, right? Uh, because research is we have to move forward. We have to um, come to new, um, new, new, uh, uh, you know, scientific processes. We have to observe new scientific processes, or uh, we have to confirm some theories, or we we are we have to be able to create new engineering devices that can be useful to humankind. So uh, the, the lines that we printed here are as small as 11 microns wide and, and made up of, again, centered nanoparticles. Um, so uh, this is, this is uh, the image on the left-hand side is um, as printed nanoparticle ink where the particle size is uh, in tens of nanometers. And on the right-hand side, um, uh, you will see that after a certain amount of uh, heat treatment, the grains have grown to about a micron or so in size. So um, using different uh, sintering methods and using different, uh, um, uh, uh, different tricks, so to speak, we can actually control the microstructure of these, these lines. Uh, this is a profilometer scan showing that uh, the very, very industrially acceptable um, line demarcation is, is um, obtained here uh, with a very, very clean and neat line formed by this printing technology. So pretty much at the time I entered academics from industry after my experience at Intel, um, I started working in uh, uh, nanoparticle 3D printing and this uh, sector was at this stage where <clears throat> people were uh, printing these uh, nanoparticles on, on two dimensional surfaces, right? So uh, the first uh, thought process in my group was that can we use this method to extend the um, printing to three dimensions, either two, 2.5 dimensions or three dimensions? So the first thing we did was um, uh, enable dielectric uh, um, sintering. So for example, um, the idea was to have, uh, the idea was to have uh, a UV curable polymer uh, in this case, this is acrylated urethane to be printed. And while the printing goes on, there would be a UV light that would, that would cure the ink. And we create, for example, a 60 micron diameter polymer structures, which would form the basis or form the three-dimensional base on which we could then print um, a metallic structures. This is a Samsung 2.4 millimeter by 2.4 millimeter chip. And on this chip is this, uh, uh, so to speak, well. And on this well, uh, the, uh, which is about 60 microns in diameter. And because um, aerosol jet printing that I described is based on pressurized gas, now we can come at an angle and print our electronic circuitry on the vertical surfaces, okay? And, and this would be useful because uh, many passives have very high uh, dielectric losses on the top surface of the semiconductor chips. And this was a very, very important problem when I was at Intel. So any method in which we can um, have the antennas or other, other uh, uh, structures uh, to be in the third dimension would be of immense use to, to industry or would be of immense use to um, as a technology tools. So, so the next thing, and you can see that we are able to achieve it here. Uh, the next thing is um, <clears throat> we, we looked at possibility of using these structures for antennas. So for example, this is a polymer pillar uh, that is about 400 microns in, in height and a metallic line comes in. This is a two uh, pad in two dimensions and a metallic line comes in and quote unquote climbs on the pillar, polymer pillar. Uh, and then uh, it has certain kind of uh, 
transmission, uh, uh, wireless transmission um, <clears throat> uh, directionality. So we could we could repeatedly create such uh, antenna structures um, by using this technique. Now, now this is uh, this is great because we are able to create now metallic structures in the third dimensions. And remember that I'm now focusing on making things. I'm not focusing on the actual functionality, right? Um, I'm not focusing on what material I can use in these three dimensional um, space. So the, I, at that time, my group entirely focused on creating new geometries that were simply impossible to make before. The, the problem with this types of structures is that you still need a polymer backbone um, in, the, in the back um, uh, in order for this metallic line to be uh, fabricated. So the next challenge we took on ourselves is, can we, uh, can we create this metallic line without any supporting polymer uh, pillar? And a, a purely uh, like a metallic line that rises in the third dimension is lithographically almost impossible to make um, without without any support structures and related complications. So I'll I'll uh, I may skip this slide, but basically the next step was we were planning on uh, creating again a metallic structures which were um, a mesh like metallic structures with. Uh, polymer supports in between, but it, this uh, research never, this uh, effort never really worked because uh, it was very difficult to remove the polymer support material. Um, the yellow thing that you see here after the stru structure was was formed because of the length scales involved. So, so the next thing my group came up with was. Uh, what if, um, let's say every droplet, right? Uh, fluid mechanicists know, every droplet, um, the, the inertia forces scale as R cube, um, uh, but the surface forces scale as R square, right? So a heavy droplet, if a heavy droplet is on a wall, it will just roll down because this, its inertia forces are, are very high. Its weight is very high. But as the droplets be become smaller and smaller, um, they become lighter and lighter because you, their weight goes down, but the surface forces don't go down at, at the same scale. So the idea we came up with was, um, uh, could we stack these droplets one above the other in, th in three dimensions um, and uh, uh, the the n plus one th droplet will stick to the previously formed droplets, which are solidified because of heat from the platen, and instead of falling down, it would stick to itself. It will lose its solvents, and the next droplet comes in. So again, I'm thinking purely in terms of geometry. I'm not thinking about materials, and I'm not thinking about the devices I'm making, right? And what we found was uh, very interestingly, such a mechanism of making structures already exists in nature. So in Namibian desert, there are these beautiful desert roses that form over millions of years. And they are formed when sulfur containing droplets um, get, get uh, evaporated. Um, and at night time, they are, they are brought into the desert uh, area and in the morning, um, the sunlight removes the solvents and the sulfur, for example, keeps on dropping on the surface. So if there is a seedling that has formed, it starts to grow and results in this beautiful three-dimensional structure. And, and essentially, this is what we would be, we were looking at. Again, pure geometry, no, no uh, we don't worry about functional materials or, or, or non-functional materials. We don't worry about um, <clears throat> uh, we, we don't worry about um, um, a specific materials to be used. So um, there were several calculations and uh, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 let's say, for example, if the droplet uh, falls down uh, or, or comes at a ledge, um, how much delta can I support uh, before my moment balance gets uh, um, uh, disturbed? 
uh, and that would determine the angle theta that I can create these three-dimensional structures at. Now, remember, we are using absolutely no support structures here. Um, <clears throat> and these are all micro-scale structures. So our calculations showed that um, this type of angle, the minimum angle would be between 30 to 40 degrees for the droplets that we were um, um, looking at. Um, the next thing was um, evaporation kinetics. Again, for fluid dynamics people, this is a simple calculation. And uh, the idea was that let's say for a 20 micron droplets, um, the temperature of the platen has to be at least 90 to 100 degrees Celsius in order to have a short time uh, before um, the solvents evaporate. So, so uh, we started with uh, creating these kinds of pillars in, in um, three dimensions, right? At increase, decreasing angle theta um, in, in, uh, um, in our lab. And, and what we found was that um, you can indeed create these three dimensional structures without any support. And what this, let's say, let's say this pillar, for example, what it represents is nanoparticles that are stacked in three-dimensional surface at micrometer length scales, right? Tens of micrometer length scales uh, without any support structure. So the only thing that is putting, uh, holding this together is at this point, at least uh, without the sintering is, is the binders in the, in the um, ink or, or in the, uh, functional material ink that we are printing. So um, as, as we know, right, in uh, first, uh, uh, you know, in engineering or e even in BSc physics, if we have one, uh, one pillar, um, uh, we need at least three pillars to support structure. Here we are using four. Um, I can also go and do reverse printing uh, to create a, a um, um, structure that shows like this. And this is nothing but a fundamental unit of a lattice, right? So if I keep on re uh, repeating this, I will, I, will get a, I will get a lattice. So um, excellent way of, of building a micro lattice by using this method. So we came up with several printing strategies and it, it takes these kinds of things take about six months to a year to develop. Um, and, you know, during that time, there are no publications, so it can be frustrating sometimes, but these are techniques and, and we spent significant amount of time in, in developing, um, uh, again, pure geometry based uh, um, structure. And as you can see that these structures are going to be extremely high surface to volume ratio structures. So in the future, they can be used for many, many applications. Um, then there are many printing strategies. Uh, I won't go into that, but this is a beautiful 3D structure that we envisioned, right? So this is a beautiful 3D structure um, um, that uh, that uh, we envisioned. She was this solar equis posture. The train she was this. The solar the, the problem with this thing is that this is nothing but a CAD image, right? This is not a real structure. So we um, printed this structure and you can see on the right um, that we can exactly replicate what we set out to achieve. And this is a one millimeter by one millimeter by 1.5 millimeter tall structure um, and with extremely intricate geometry. Um, extremely uh, um, intricate internal geometry, which would be impossible to make by um, any lithographic methods or any method, any any micro, even micro machining methods otherwise. So, so this is again the power of 3D printing that I can go and start to create geometries and structures that were impossible to make in the past. So uh, this is a second structure, which is uh, um, hexagonal and uh, um, octahedral. Um, and again, you can see on the right-hand side, uh, within a millimeter by millimeter by two millimeters, which we can see with our naked eyes, right? Very, very small uh, structures. Um, we can replicate exactly what the CAD image sets out to do. Um, once, so all the things that I showed before were without any 
um, um, sintering. So once the once we heat the entire thing, um, we we can uh, the nanoparticles fuse together, and uh, um, the the um, uh, binders and and other. Uh, materials that is holding the structure in the green state is um, goes away and we have a metallic uh, three-dimensional lattice structure. A, a, a focused ion beam section shows that there are internal um, porosities as expected from, from sintering of nanoparticles. Um, so in other words, this method can now create, so again, lo looking purely at geometry, we can create structures that are uh, a, a millimeter to a centimeter in size, uh, where unit lattice is of the order of hundreds of uh, micrometers, 200 micrometers, for example, where each of the pillars uh, is a pure metallic solid pillar with uh, um, about 40 to 50 microns in diameter. And then uh, these are sintered nanoparticles. So you have some nanoscale um, structure itself. So this is a hierarchical way of uh, making things um, uh, at, with, with a control of over five orders of magnitude in length scale, which otherwise would be very, very difficult to do um, by conventional manufacturing methods. Um, once we are able to create these structures without any support, then kind of sky is the limit, right, uh, so to speak. And uh, we started to make various pillars and started to look at now, okay, now we have uh, 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 developed a completely new method of making things, three-dimensional structures, microstructures using nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. Now, where can we use them? So before uh, uh, we do that, I wanted to kind of quickly go through the interesting science that these engineering structures can, can uh, lead to. So the first thing is by different sintering temperatures, we can change the grain size in these structures as well as the porosities. And people who have uh, worked on, on materials um, aspects of, of things and connect that to mechanical uh, behavior, we know that porous structures are expected to be more ductile, right? But at the same time, uh, and our mechanical properties should be independent of the grain size, at least in, based on continuum mechanics. But in reality, you see that a very, very heavy influence of, of uh, porosity on, um, uh, on the mechanical behavior. So uh, on the left-hand side are, are uh, structures uh, or micro pillars. Uh, these are 90 microns in diameter and made up of again nanoparticles with 250 nanometer grain size. When we compress them, they break like sticks, okay? Um, you can see the, the material breaking like this. And the reason has to do with how dislocations pass through grains and they cannot pass through grain boundaries. So there's a lot of ductility, there's a lot of uh, uh, brittleness in the system. However, if we look at structures that have large grains and centered to high temperature, they bend like extremely soft materials. And this is mainly because dislocations can pass through large grains and um, that creates inherent ductility in these micro pillars. So this is again, one aspect of a, a interesting material science that we can look at. Um, this is another uh, a scaffold structure and on the left-hand side is finite element analysis uh, to capture how the stress strain curve of these look. And we can we can uh, take a look at this uh, uh, these these uh, um, uh, behaviors where we see this periodic softening and uh, hardening behavior if we look at the engineering stress versus engineering strain diagrams. So so again, this is getting into too much mechanical engineering. So I will kind of uh, move ahead. Um, this is electrical behavior. We can, we can vary the resistivity of these structures um, as a function of the sintering temperature. And uh, so, so pretty much um, a lot of interesting behaviors we can capture using, um, using this method. Uh, so the next thing is we now started to look at what we can use these structures for, right? 
Again, as I said, we have a new, uh, uh, my group has developed a new method of making microstructures using nanoparticles without any support structures. With some constraints, we can make a lot of three-dimensional structures, how to use it, right? So the first application we looked at was at brain computer interfaces. So um, I don't know if, if this is a very well-known uh, field uh, in, in, uh, in material scientists yet, but um, people have uh, people who are paraplegic or, or quadriplegic who cannot use their hands and legs, for example, in their brains, uh, there are, there are needle-like uh, interfaces or needle-like uh, structures that are inserted and these needle-like structures can capture um, um, what they are thinking. So these, they, these needle-like structures capture neuronal firing or signaling between neurons within the brain. And uh, we can actually, we know which area of the brain controls hand movement, for example. And we just, in, in these cases, uh, the, the, the uh, patient is just asked to think about hand movement, right? And when that happens, these electrodes capture the neuron, the, the co uh, communication between the neurons, and they give the same order to the motor that is controlling this uh, prosthetic hand. So this is an extremely exciting area where people who could otherwise not use hands and legs are able to use them simply by thinking about it. And it, it does happen. I have seen this, this um, happen uh, here, right here in, in Pittsburgh. So these devices exist. And so, so the idea is, can we create needles uh, using the uh, method that I described before in order to uh, uh, create uh, an interface with the, new, with the electrical uh, firing within uh, amongst the neurons? So uh, with commercially available brain computer interfaces consist of something called Utah array. Um, these are devices with about 100 to 500 sites per centimeter square. These are the needles that are inserted into the brain. And at the tip of the needles is the, is the conductive portion. Everything else is insulated and uh, they capture the signal. There are other types of brain computer interfaces where um, you have, a, you have a, a needle here that has several sites that can capture the, the electrical signaling between the, the neurons, and then uh, it is transmitted to a microprocessor. Uh, so uh, conventional needles could be uh, fabricated uh, at a, at a, uh, using conventional lithography, we can make these needles at about 100 to 500 sites per centimeter square. In fact, most of the times the, the number of sites is 100 sites per centimeter square. But using the brain, uh, using 3D printing method that I showed before, we could potentially um, uh, go up to 2,600 sites per centimeter square, which is uh, on an average about one order of magnitude increase in the number of sites. Um, so this is, an, uh, again, one example of the brain computer interface needles that we, uh, we have fab fabricated. Um, uh, this is uh, this is a, a image. Uh, this is a brain of a mouse, and inside the brain of the mouse, we have a, a ten by ten uh, array of um, needles that were inserted at much higher density than what I showed before. And you can see that, um, that we did not see any bed of nails effect or. Uh, um, um, effect where where uh, the the nails would would uh, harm or, or completely destroy the brain but uh, these needles have uh, in gotten inserted into the brain and and come out and very very importantly we are able to capture action potentials uh, this is work done in in yitri group in uh, at carnegie mellon where we give them the devices and they uh, use mouse um, uh, uh, living mice to, to record these electrical firing between the neurons. So now we have a, have a method of making highly customizable device with, uh, um, with uh, pretty much extremely high density compared to what was possible before with high signal to noise ratio. 
um, uh, this is a video of uh, um, uh, a 512 uh, device that that uh, a time lapse video of fabrication of 512 device. Um, uh, my my student Sandra Ricci worked on this. So so excellent. Um, way of uh, customizing and being able to capture signals from various portions of the brain, which is again very difficult to do using conventional lithographic methods. So this was uh, this is another method where we use UV curing to uh, create uh, polymer structures that are um, uh, in in uh, three dimensions and that can carry light. And, and the idea is to use this for optogenetic uh, stimulation in, in the brain. So um, again, uh, this is, this is uh, um, uh, one of the areas where we are using this 3D printing method and new 3D structures to uh, create a device that interfaces with the brain and is, is able to capture signals um, that our neurons uh, fire and, and communicate each other uh, with. Uh, the next one is biomonitoring decals. Um, these are uh, uh, devices that are um, important for use and my student Jacob Brenneman is working on it. Um, so um, as you can see that for people, elderly people who have a risk of falling or who, who need continuous monitoring of bio, bio characters, right? Um, they have to wear these kinds of uh, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, kind of uh, very bulky uh, things underneath their clothing in order to interface with the uh, with the with the body, so that their various uh, EKG and other uh, uh, biological health uh, uh, characteristics can be captured. Uh, these are very bulky structures, so. Um, uh, we, the, what we are working on is creating, using polydimethylsiloxane substrate, uh, 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 an elastomer substrate uh, such as PDMS, and then directly printing uh, various devices onto the, onto the structure in order to create patches, which can then be applied to human body at different locations. Um, so, uh, um, I will I will show you guys. So this is a, a, a interconnect metallic interconnect uh, that has serpentine geometry and it is getting stressed. Um, so you can see that uh, up to a strain of around fifty percent, you can you can stretch these uh, metallic conductors um, in this in this PDMS patch. While doing this work, we also see some delamination um, and we are looking at, or we have already uh, submitted a paper on uh, looking at delamination mechanism maps as to what are the thicknesses, for example, of these polymers, what are the thicknesses of the metal layer inside um, and, and under what conditions can these um, uh, layers delaminate from each other. Uh, and these are excellent design guidelines um, that we will be supplying to, to, to industry. Um, the, the next device is lithium ion batteries. Um, as, as you know, uh, lithium ion batteries are extremely surface sensitive. Um, so for example, uh, for high surface to volume ratio materials, we can have um, um, lithium, uh, lithium uh, intercalation done on uh, at different locations. Um, if, if we have, again, porous structure, then the, the amount of stress reduces significantly. As an example here, there is one reduction in uh, by one order of magnitude. And uh, uh, if, if the electrode structure has high surface area, then lithiation can cause um, a very high electrode utilization. Um, in, in Tesla cars or any other electric cars today, there is about 50% more particle loading that is done because uh, lithiation or intercalation is extremely, um, uh, it's, a, it's a diffusion driven process. So there are large areas of the electrode that never get lithiated uh, because of cracks or many other reasons. But, but such a porous structure would help with that. Um, and uh, uh, we would get very high electrode utilization. Uh, 
so what we did was again used our geometry method right and uh, uh, created uh, a, a three dimensional scaffold type structure where we have these uh, um, uh, pillar structures um, uh, using fib we can show that there are um, um, there is porosity here and when we use this for um, uh, as as lithium ion batteries, we get about four times increase in uh, um, um, specific capacity in this case, uh, which is very close to the theoretical maximum uh, capacity one can get. So, so potentially this work can have uh, can lead to um, a significant increase in in charge capacity. We believe that for um, uh, different materials, we would get up to. 1.5 times the charge capacity and can potentially revolutionize the, the energy storage field. Um, and, and again, this is, uh, you know, this, this manufacturing method has been, has been patented and um, we, are, we are actually talking with some, some companies and investors to, to take this to the, to the market. Um, the, the next one is a very interesting work that we recently did, and um, I wanted to purposely keep my talk like uh, 45, 50, 45 minutes so that we have ample times for questions. But um, uh, what we have done is we use this 3D printing method again to create these micro pillars, right, as we showed before, and then we coat them with uh, reduced graphene oxide. And uh, we, we have a chemistry using which uh, uh, the, the antigens are then connected. So antigens are the uh, molecules on the virus itself. So whenever we introduce a liquid that contains uh, COVID-19 antibodies, um, these antibodies think of these uh, antigens, which are just nothing but protein molecules as part of a real virus and the antibodies try to attack it. And this signal is captured within about uh, 11 seconds. And so, so you can see that without and with antibodies, the um, electrochemical impedance signal is, is increased um, significantly. And um, the RCT increases significantly. And this work is, is, is in press right now um, uh, in, in advanced materials and will come out soon. But the main thing is we are now starting um, um, to, we just recently received permission to uh, carry out human trials um, in, in Pittsburgh here so that we can convert this discovery into, um, into, into an assay. So again, we are using 3D printing to create microstructures using nanomaterials and then using these different geometries to, to create different very, very useful devices. Um, so I just wanted to run this video um, um, that, that uh, we, we, uh, the, the work we did, I think this explains everything very, very concisely. So any number of slides won't, won't help. So um, yeah. my group has created an electrochemical device that can detect COVID-19 antibodies within 10 seconds. This is the fastest detection time that has been reported so far. The device is of a size of a US quarter and is connected to a smartphone platform for easy and convenient readout. This device has three-dimensional architected electrodes fabricated by 3D nanoparticle printing, which is a method developed at CMU. It enhances the efficiency of detection down to one picomolar concentration. The three-dimensional electrodes are coated with antigens from the virus that selectively combine with antibodies in the liquid that we introduce into the device. The amount of liquid required for testing of the antibodies is of the order of one finger prick. This is a multidisciplinary research for which I'm collaborating with Professor Gao, who is a virologist at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. What is more exciting is that we have a chemistry that can wash the antibodies from one test to regenerate the device within one minute. We can carry out a test and then use the same device within a minute to carry out a second test. The device created by my group is a platform technology and it can be used to detect biomarkers for other diseases as well. As a next step, we will be working with University of Pittsburgh Medical Center for trials with COVID-19 patients. As a research university, we are committed to serving our society. 
Um, so, yeah. So, uh, uh, so, so, uh, you know, what what I personally feel is that these nanoparticle three D printing methods or um, additive manufacturing methods have generated an extremely exciting possibility of of creating new geometries, materials, and uh, microstructures and um, we can we can we can envision a device that has a power source that can be three D printed, right? Uh, we can envision a device in which communication uh, um, uh, things such as antennas are are three D printed as well. Um, the interconnects, for example, two uh, D or three D interconnects can be fabricated by three D printing as well. Um, uh, we can have the planar interconnects that are that are uh, generated by 3D printing, and then we have a sensing element uh, which which could use any type of um, sensing mechanism. Right? It could be electrochemical, it could be bioelectric uh, um, uh, mechanism, and, and and so on and so forth, and all of them integrated into a one single. Um, a device that is convenient for the patient to use, for example, or that is um, uh, convenient to manufacture or, or has some kind of advantage over the current state of the art. Um, so I want to kind of conclude with uh, 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 mentioning that progress in micro nanoscale 3D printing has, has led to progress in, in uh, understanding of some of the fundamental concepts, right? For example, diffusion and uh, mass transport is something that, uh, uh, you know, this is a work I did not mention, but we have created very, very um, excellent uh, platforms where different theories can be tested out. Uh, uh, we can have materials and uh, material science and mechanics uh, evaluated using this. Um, this creates, this has created breakthrough devices, right? With, with unique uh, capabilities that are novel compared to what the current state of the art um, um, explained, uh, you know, my, my group is very, very excited to be working in this interdisciplinary area where we can create devices that are useful to the society, right? And as, as I showed in this talk, all we worked on was different geometries. We did not worry about materials, right? And still we were able to get into several, um, uh, several exciting areas of applications. So imagine what will happen when we combine different materials, when we use uh, introduce 2D materials into these geometries. Um, th these are there are extremely large areas that are wide open to to explore. Um, I want to thank uh, different uh, research agencies, uh, National Institutes of Health. They have a large, uh, uh, huge grants that that uh, they have been funding me with uh, uh, the National Science Foundation. Um, uh, which focuses more on fundamental science, Army Research Lab, which is very more application-oriented research that I have been working on in, in lattice materials, and U.S. Department of Energy, where, where uh, I did not talk about this work, but this is uh, on, on high-temperature sensors in um, um, different, um, um, different applications and several other funding agencies as well. And uh, as everybody knows, without um, the students' uh, help, right, nothing can happen. We, we faculty members, researchers can think about a lot of ideas, but without the students actually being in the lab, working there and enhancing our ideas, right, um, this is uh, uh, just not possible uh, to happen. So I want to thank all my students. Many of them have joined Intel now. Um, um, which is with some strange coincidence, so many of them have joined Intel. And then um, I'm very happy to take take questions. Thank you, thank you, sir, for such a nice presentation and expressive and elaborative presentations. And sir has collected a nanoparticles theory between Product generation brain computer interface, bio device. Thank you, sir. If anybody have any questions, please ask. Uh, 
Hi, Rahul sir. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to multi-year uh, uh, 3D printing in uh, that uh, uh, nanoparticle? So, so, so you are asking whether there are multi-material 3D printing possible? Yes, uh, multi-layer uh, materials like organic. Uh, uh, basically, I am uh, working in uh, uh, breath analysis, uh, uh, breath analysis sensor. So there is a uh, some uh, kind of multi-layer, mono-layer capped material. So it is possible to do in uh, uh, 3D printing. Yes, yes. So the the minimum layer thickness we can print is about uh, 200 nanometers. So. Um, it is, it is, uh, so, so we can perhaps do some uh, preconditioning of the substrate and then, uh, try to print as thin layers as possible. Um, but typically 200 to 250 nanometer thick. So if you have particles that are that size, then, um, uh, we can have one single layer of particles, but getting a one, um, atomic layer structure is, will be something that, uh, uh, will be challenging, but I, I'm sure it's, it's, uh, something that, that can be thought about. Okay. Okay. Some, uh, some, uh, uh we need to be, uh, wait for some while, uh, because, uh, we need to be uh, five nanometer to four, four nanometer to five nanometer multi-layer capping layer. So that's why it is not possible right now in uh, 3D printing. I think so. Right, right. But at the same time, the, there could be some, uh, uh, you know, some treatment of the su substrate in which there is some attractive force that enables only single layer or few layers to, to remain there. So there needs to be some post-processing treatment, but, but this can be thought about. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, lecture. Now it is late night there. And yes, it is, it is past one o'clock hmm? in the morning. So I'm, yeah. but I'm really glad that, uh, you know, I could share the work and. Um... Yeah, regarding this uh, battery, uh, that you see that uh, the materials uh, which you are that, that self-standing uh, film you have done, I think it is without support. Without support, right? Uh, so that is the silicon anode or silicon base. So, so we we tried silicon base, but silicon based anodes expand contract extremely uh, violently. So the 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 structures break in a few cycles, right? Um, so what we do is, uh, this is uh, um, LFP um, uh, anode and then uh, mixed with silver uh, nanoparticles as well. Yeah. yeah. This is basically LFP. Uh, LFP and silver, yes. yes. LFP and These silver. Are the two materials we have been able to. And what is the capacity uh, we achieved here? To so um, around uh, 380 milliamp hour per, per gram. So it is near to the theoretical maximum. Okay. Yeah. So there is no uh, wasted material there. Okay. And the, uh, how many cycles we did? So we did about um, 80 cycles, I think. Yeah. So okay. the, the no fading. 40 cycles. But yeah. Without any fading capacity. Fading. Correct. Correct. Good. There is a fade in first few cycles always, yeah, right? Is but then it stabilizes. Raoul, sir, thank you very much. Uh, we heard your lecture as well as during our masters. We heard your father's lecture also, sir. Okay. Thank <laughs> in you University so of Pune. Oh, we are very fortunate to hear from two generations, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, his uh, memory is always with uh, with me and. Uh, uh, it is it is uh, uh, great to great to connect with our people yes yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you sir thank you sir for sharing lot of time in the night time also for us and we will remember and we will be in touch with you sir. thank you sir yes yes definitely definitely yeah okay thank you, yeah. Thank you everyone thank you yeah. uh, we will move towards our next session our alumni coordinate these uh, events and play a key role in the organizing this workshop.
Dr. Datta Trey Latte. He is a scientist at Physical and Metal Chemistry Division, National Chemical Laboratory, Pune. Uh, Dr. Latte sir has completed his B.Sc. from our college, that is New York Commerce and Science College, Parnir, and M.Sc. from Amar Nagar. And then he went to uh, in University of Pune, Department of Physics. He has completed his postdoctoral work at JN CSR IIC Bangalore under the guidance of Bharat Ratna Professor C N R Rao, and further he went to postdoctoral work in Northwestern University USA under the mentorship of Vinayak Dravid. He has been published more than hundred research articles in the international journals like uh, Advanced Functional Materials, Advanced Materials. So has. research interest in nano materials nano electronic devices light emitting diodes semiconductors photo detectors nano switches non volatile memory devices piezoelectric to generate cell powder nano devices and uh, nano technology for water purification and waste management uh, dr dattatre latte latte sir has got many awards Like uh, CINT USA Research Project Award 2015, DAE BRNS Research Project Award 2015, DST Young Scientist Fast Track Project Award 2014, Ramanujan National Fellowship of DST Government of India 2013, Post Doctor Fellowship of Northwestern University Chicago uh, from 2010 to 2012. <coughs> DST Nano Science and Technology uh, Post Doctoral Fellowship Jain CSR Bangalore DAE Park Jarif and SRV University of Pune 2004 So thank you very much uh, I would like to request you sir for starting your sessions please sir uh, uh, thank you uh, professor anil uh, for nice introduction can you hear me clearly yes sir yes sir can you see me also yes, yes sir. sir okay uh, so thank you anil uh, for a very nice introduction uh, at the outset i like to thank uh, professor dilip dubey uh, and principal of my college uh, professor arpya hair uh, for this kind of invitation to deliver a talk on our experimental work which have, we have carried out uh, in the last 7 to 8 years i also like to thank uh, and express my sincere thanks to Uh, Dr. B. B. Kale, uh, Professor G. D. Yadav, and Dr. B. L. V. Prasad, uh, Maharashtra Academy of Science and uh, Metal Research Society of India. I also like to thank uh, uh, to Professor S. B. Kupanidi, Professor Umesh Wagmare, with whom I have worked uh, closely uh, during past on some of the research projects. Today I will be showing uh, uh, some of the work or what chemistry and the recipes we have developed. For synthesizing various 2D materials and 2D hybrid materials, and the kind of application it has in a real-time technological devices. Uh, before moving, uh, I like to just heard we have just heard a very exciting talk by Professor Umesh Wagmare and Dr. Rahul Panath. And uh, before I move further, uh, I like to thank uh, uh, the funding agencies, without which it is difficult to carry out such kind of work. i also like to thank uh, current and past students for their hard work and uh, sincere uh, sincerity in the work i also like to thank my mentors teachers collaborators from uh, various parts of the world uh, i have just mentioned here i have worked with uh, uh, professor <coughs> bb kale professor s b kupanidi umesh wakmare uh, on some of the common projects on 2d hybrid materials and there so before just i move i like to uh, uh, introduce a journal which is aip advances where i am fortunate to be a editor uh, we are welcome to submit your paper uh, to this uh, very exciting journal is very fast publication journal and publishes mostly original research and review article also uh, also uh, editing one special issue on opto electronic devices those who are working on the kind of opto electronic devices they are welcome to submit a uh, research at original research article or review article uh, the deadline is actually 30th january 
so they can submit the article there is another journal which is known as iop sci note is also exciting journal so all are welcome to submit your research article to these journals as well so before just um, i move to next slides i just wanted to know, uh, inform you that achieving science or success in science does not depend on the specific geographical position it completely depends on your dedication the ability of the excellence of the outcomes we have uh, in your hand and so today i am going to talk about uh, the devices or uh, 2d materials devices and their hybrid materials Uh, for various application, for example, improving the energy harvesting devices and technique which demand actually innovation across the device evolution scale from materials to circuit. As a result, it brings together researchers from various disciplines such as the energy device, energy science, the uh, chemistry point of view, the physics point of view, the engineering devices, and engineering people. They can ultimately come together. and they can make 2d hybrid materials devices for various application for example the ultimate aim of all these devices 2d materials and 2d hybrid materials is to the purpose is to develop a cell powered devices based on this 2d material because 2d why 2d because it having a large surface area because of the having large surface area there are many exploration happens in 2d hybrid materials and energy harvesting devices related the aim of my the, uh, the 2d materials here which i am going to show you is to basically to develop a various approaches to allow integration of this 2d materials into energy conversion and storage devices one of the objective is also to develop uh, the industry demand which is very important and the, basically for the indian indian environment the cost of the devices the cost of the devices should be very low that is has to be affordable by all uh, uh, indian people basically we work on various 2d materials and their look up their application for for example solar cell the uh, the materials for uh, the lithography technique again the material for the uh, fuel cells energy storage batteries and uh, other applications so what i am going to show you uh, the basically one of the need Uh, for the devices based on this uh, kind of devices is the low cost sensor exactly cell powered uh, and then flexible variable sensor and for example i am going to use this uh, device uh, materials for cardiovascular disease how to detect the cardiovascular disease you know uh, with a low cost low power device basically for the commercial uh, use of uh, all this application for example uh, just we have uh, uh, written a very nice review article which is just accepted in a nano research basically how the patient can behave if a patient what kind of sensor it needed for example you want to communicate to other uh, people and the kind of the communication which needed uh, based on these devices is very important for example what kind of devices it is needed uh, for communicating to the uh, various for example he has you know, some emergency so the kind of the flexible devices he can be coated on his hand or on his forehead or on his foot uh, or on his shoes and the how the motion is behaving the how the red heart rate is behaving and all these things depending upon it has to be connected to mobile mobile signal again can be connected to internet and it has to be given simultaneously to two places for example it has to be given to emergency it has the signal also given to a family and the clinical so depending upon the signal which is coming from the patient so this emergency vehicle can come to the patient he can depending upon the internet it can locate the position of the patient where it is located and the family also same time inform okay where is patient what he is feeling and the same time doctor is also inform and then doctor can also suggest immediately the kind of medicine the kind of treatment it has to be uh, given so that the next action can be done so what are the things needed for all these things basically basically we need a flexible wearable sensor for fail monitoring and other related activities for example this is one example so i have to definitely sensors they are based on 2d materials and they uh, can be a very thin layer they can be mounted on uh, our skin anywhere and most importantly they might be a, a transparent very important because they might have uh, the transparent color Yeah, can you see my slide, right? Yes, yes, yes. 
I think I, there was a slight problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, just move. Huh? Okay, I think I think I just uh, because uh, there is a slight network issue. I'll just off my video. Yes. Can you see my slides? Uh, no, not at all. Okay, okay. Let me huh, go to huh, to network. Okay, can you see? No, all right. I think it not is yet. just uh, still uh, showing. Uh, this network is moving. I don't know. I think we need to wait for moment. Moment, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or you can make it off and again restart. Uh, yeah, that can be done. Yes. Stop slide sharing and again start slide sharing. Okay. Okay. Okay, can you see right? Uh, yes, but yes, yes. Okay, uh, just go to next slide and maybe. Network is not stable, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, network is not stable. Yes, yes. Maybe I'll just restart again. Hello. Ha, ah, hello. If still there is problem, you can send the presentation to me. I can. Uh, uh, okay, okay, I think uh, that can be done. Yes. Uh, let me try one second. Otherwise, I'll just send you. Okay. I think, okay, I'll just forward you, sir. I'll just forward yeah, yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sir, I have just mailed you. Okay, okay I will check. To which account you mail? Uh, this is okay. ready mail. Ready, just yes. Okay, by the time I will just try once again, if it is coming. No, I think, yeah, still, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think, sir, you can share, yes. Okay, he's asking Microsoft password. 
oh it is it should not yes when you sir you just restart your laptop and then it might work mm. okay i'm just वन ड्राइव फॉर बिजनेस खाली करते सर हाँ सर हाँ पासवर्ड संगत मैं तुम्हारा बगा डी एस जीरो से चलीस जीरो आठ डी एल डी ए दास डी ए एस जीरो से चलीस जीरो आठ बगा ओपन होते हाँ दास दास डी ए एस जीरो से चलीस जीरो आठ कैपिटल स्मॉल आई थिंक स्मॉल इज स्मॉल डी कैपिटल टाकून बघा डी कॅपिटल अदरवाइज बाकी स्मॉल हा अद्याप नाही तुम्ही पण ट्राय करा तुम्ही पण ट्राय करा दोघांच्याकडे ज्याच ओपन होईल करो आपल्या कोणत्या पासून ओके फाइल से हलो हलो हाँ सर कैन यू सी हो 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 दिस्ते यस सर यस सर नेक्स्ट स्लाइड इट शोज प्लीज कीप दिस स्लाइड एंड गो आइड हेलो uh during the transition of slide it is taking some time mm -hmm. by the time i am also trying to download let's see what is happening no it has uh, na maybe a large size image that's why ha huh? taking ha huh?
Sir, I will just make a PDF and I will send you in a minute. Yeah. सर पीडीएफ फाइल पाठ होतो आई एम जस्ट सेंडिंग यू पीडीएफ फाइल हो हो पाठ हो PDF. I'm just uploading PDF. Okay. Oh, 
डांगेला विचार तो है नहीं तेरे सांगे चीज नहीं है कैसे सांगे ओके सर आई एम जस्ट सेंडिंग द ईमेल पीडीएफ हेलो सर हेलो सर यू आर म्यूट हाँ हाँ बोला बोला सर जो आई जस्ट सेंड यू ईमेल हाँ ठीक है रेडी प्लस ना हाँ रेडी प्लस ओके ओके Not it received, sir. Is big file? Refresh, sir. Just refresh. Got it? Not it. Not it. सर सेंड जाली टिकट ना ओ या आई ऑलरेडी सेंड 2 मिनट्स बैक जस्ट रिफ्रेश सेंड ना बंद करो यू कैन शेयर द पीडीएफ आल्सो सर ओ या हम पीडीएफ कैन बी शेयर्ड बिकॉज़ इट विल बी विद स्मॉल साइज ना Try sharing. Otherwise, I'm waiting for the file. Yes, 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 yes. Can you share? Uh, I'm just trying. Huh? Yes. Do you receive an email? No, not it. Okay. I don't know what has happened. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> 
there may be connectivity problem with you sir hmm yeah yeah because of a... which you are not able to hmm. as well as you are not able to send the file yes uh, but it is showing it is has been sent hmm okay दास कि होते सर डू यू रिसीव ईमेल नॉट इट ओ सरप्राइज प्लीज ओपन युअर पीडीएफ फाइल सर हाँ तेज करते sir i received the file i will share the file okay 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 <coughs> are you able to see the slides uh let me see yes sir okay yes sir uh i think we just go to next slide ha ha yes मेस हैपन बिकॉज ऑफ द लो नेटवर्क कनेक्टिविटी एट माई एंड एंड द सेंसर विच आई वॉज टॉकिंग सेंसर विच वी आर प्लानिंग टू डेवलप फॉर एग्जाम्पल you can see the stretchable transparent and ultra sensitive sense sensor for emission emotion detection for example i have connected a two sensors uh, one at forehead and another at near the mouth to so see the kind of the sensor response the measured in terms of electrical signals such as have measured uh, resistance uh, as a function of time you see if a person start laughing how the resistance get change the moment he start na, na uh, stop laughing how the resistance get change and uh, at the same time if the resistance at forehead if the person starting a uh, crying how oh, resistance get change you can see that there is a large change in resistance right and the means 
the the chemistry biosensors and all these things you need to understand how i the, there is a large change in when the person is laughing the when the person is crying and all these things they need to understand all these things for example the same kind of measurement we can do it when the sensor is kept near the mouth we see how the change in resistance takes place and the moment uh, uh, another when the person start laughing and the person start crying and the person start crying stop crying the, the the kind of resistance measurement can be done uh, according to the uh, this methodology uh, sir next slide please the kind of materials needed uh, uh, for uh, the fabricating uh, the kind of the sensor are various 1d materials 2d materials and all these things all the technological things has to be come together to make uh, the kind of sensor based on flexible devices basic principle then all kind of this sensor is basically a uh, piezoelectric or pyelectric piezo resistive chemo resistive and many other things uh, the chemistry need to be understand well before making such kind of devices next slide please sir yeah basically uh, uh, what you need actually we need uh, this is experimental uh, result published in uh, by roho et al uh, in uh, 2015 the kind of materials we needed actually we take a pdms and then a coat a film of pu p dot pss and then in between you can either coat uh, the film of uh, single wall carbon nanotubes or maybe you can coat uh, the graphene uh, as a, a seed layer and the see the, the response of the sensor as a function of strain as well as the function of change in resistance and all these things you see the time the moment you start bending see 0% to 1.6% to 2.1% 2.5% how resistant be you the kind of sensor which we can mount on our skin is very important for example another time the transmittance of the sensor is also important and along with the sensor resistant change as a function of resistor as a function of strain and all these things for example you we can measure the gas factor and other uh, measurement to predict the which kind of sensor the which kind of material is very good for our uh, skin and all these things next slide please the report have been made uh, for the improvement of stability of and reliability of this kind of devices for example this sensor need to be integrated together for example they need to communicate to each other for example they need energy harvesting and uh, same time the sample handling devices need to be developed by considering specific service need for example the sensor which we were uh, made are variable we are basically variable sensor basically they are also smart they need smart electronics basically you have to interface with the software different electronics part circuitry telecommunication basically we need to understand the the chemistry behind the skin for example the various biomedical applications and all these things basically to integrate all kinds of sensor materials to integrate a sensor so that it can be flexible as well as it can be a fast uh, response and recovery time and this kind of sensor can be implemented to the skin uh, next slide please sir so uh, so kindly looking all these aspects so we working on the materials like graphene and graphene like other 2d materials for example there are n number of uh, 2d materials along with the kind of materials there are certain advantage and disadvantage of graphene for example graphene is a zero semi metal there is no gap between conduction and valence band so it's just the conduction band and valence band they are just touching to each other so basically and then the kind of 2d materials there are because the inorganic layer material basically they have naturally a band gap and band gap can be tunable depending upon the thickness of these materials and there are certain advantage if you can make a hybrid materials for example you can coat uh, you can make a graphene at 2d structures hetero structures along with this 2d materials and then one can make a hybrid device to get a certain advantage and make this uh, na, uh, the devices workable for example if you want to make a kind of devices the what kind of things we do next slide please sir so for example we grow lot of these 2d materials there are a lot of this in a transition metal dihedral cogenerate families once we identify materials for example we identify mos2 the once we identify mos2 okay for example which layer of mos2 is very good for the sensing application for example this, uh, uh, the biosensor application maybe two layer of mos2 might be very good or maybe three layer of mos2 is good once we identify this by theoretical background 
we go the material so we choose different kind of methodology we do a lot of chemistry uh, to grow all these materials and then once we grow the materials basically we study all these properties for example crystalline quality of the material layer stacking how many layers actually are present when one material is grown for example how much we cal calculate the thickness of the thickness measurement by using afm tm and all uh, sort of other measurement technique then optical properties this is very important because you need to understand how the material is behaving and all these things once you have done all these things mechanical properties whether they are uh, na mechanical robustness or not no once we identify the mechanical properties is good enough then we can make electronic device and then we we'll do electrical properties measurement and then we convert into a uh, uh, sensor or flexible sensor and then uh, the kind of measurement we do uh, next slide please sir so basically uh, graphene uh, very attracting materials since uh, past uh, decades because it is atomically thin carbon c the graphite which we find in our pencil is simply a stack of stack of graphene layers as number of layers are much more so whatever we write on paper is still a graphite because number of layers are more graphene is mother of all graphitic dimension you just you can just wrap up the graphene sheet you will get the zero dimensional buckyball structure you can roll the graphene sheet you will get one dimensional carbon nanotubes you can stack graphene layers on each other you will get three dimensional bulk graphite structure basically graphene consists of consists of parallel sheet of carbon atom in a hexagonal lattice graphite is made from graphene sheet 1 mm of graphite has 3 million layers of graphene graphene which is composed of one atom thick sheet of carbon atom hexagonal is being produced today but only limited quantities and at high cost when this material can be mass produced the cost effectiveness its impact could be quite destructive for example the potential to realize the ballastic transport at room temperature this is one of the important property of this graphene and along with why people are interesting to work on this material because it has a certain advantage for example it is the first example of 2d atomic crystal another advantage is it has promise for number of application and what really makes graphene so special is its electronic properties its zero overlap semi metal with valence band and conduction band touching at point k and q not it has two atoms per unit cell and another advantage is that the presence of extra electron in carbon bond when there is a extra electron at carbon bond it brings lot of uh, extraordinary properties this presence of extra bond uh, electron at carbon bond which is known as pi uh, pi electron which actually brings lot of advantages for this material uh, next slide please sir so uh, the kind of uh, application this graphene has you have just listed the many properties of uh, this graphene for example thickness you can see the uh, the strongest material on the earth the most stretchable material the electronic point of view the mobility of this material and then very importantly high specific area for example the kind of for example if i just imagine i am in parnell college and if i someone give me a 10 gram of graphene i can cover a whole parnell city so this is the application of this you know, uh, uh, kind of material so and another around is the processing technology and the cost carbon basically should have low cost the transparent material and the density of material is very important for considering application of this material next slide please sir and that when what i see actually as a physics point of view the graphite structure which is composed of stack of graphene layers you can see uh, the graphite structure here composed of layered structure you can see the middle there is a dirac cone uh, the conduction band and valence band they just touch to each other to make this as a zero band gap semiconductor or semi metal uh, next slide slide please what is the unique uh, the structure uh, in this material is the energy of electron which is basically linearly dependent on the wave vector uh, at the k and k not point you can see uh, that's why this becomes a dirac solid solid and ballastic transport of carriers and many others you can see that this is the, this is the transport properties of the uh, graphene feedback transistor apply you can apply negative voltage gate voltage you have still conductivity you can have uh, positive gate voltage you will get the still conductivity because of the uh, one side we have uh, electron as a whole carrier and another side we have pole as a uh, carrier that's why you will get the kind of the uh, um, uh, the nature of this characteristics of field effect transistor which is known as ambipolar field effect transistor because you apply 
negative grid voltage and positive grid, grid voltage, still you have charge carriers in your uh, device. Uh, next slide, please. For example, I just go back and see that now this 12th standard, uh, this energy equation, E square is equal to M square C raised to 4 plus P square C square. So, for example, because graphene is a flat sheet, when you apply electric field, the electron in the graphene sheet to it move so fast, it having so high speed velocity with a very high speed velocity, at a certain time, it behaves as a massless particle. But electron has a mass, actually. Electron has a mass. Because of the speed, it behaves as a massless particle where when you put m is equal to zero, you'll get E is equal to Cp. Means energy with which electron move in a graphene sheet is directly proportional to one upon 300 times the velocity of light. Therefore, it has tremendous application in electronic devices and all these things because electron moves very fast in this kind of uh, materials. Next slide, please. How to make a graphene? Okay, basically how to make a graphene? For example, I need a, some kind of a, a graphite crystal. It may be a, a HOPC, so that it will be a very pure kind of crystal. And I need actually a scotch tape, a simple scotch tape in the market. And I need a, a silicon dioxide substrate. And what I do actually, uh, I will try to uh, take uh, the, this scotch tape, uh, put it on the, uh, the HOPG. Next slide, please. Uh, HOPG, uh, this cost, I will take the scotch tape, I will put it on HOPG, then I slowly peel it up, and I have a silicon dioxide substrate here. I will slowly put that uh, scotch tape on the silicon dioxide substrate. I will slowly rub the tape and take, remove the tape. And I will simply go to optical microscope and see the kind of the, the fringes I have received on the substrate. Uh, next slide, please. So what I can see, so I will take HOPG, uh, then next slide, please, sir. Uh, run few slides, Nick. And uh, then I, I will uh, do the uh, optical imaging. So what I see in optical imaging, you can see, when I go to optical microscope, you can see a different color contrast. You can see for one layer, where the thickness of one layer of graphene is exactly point, uh, uh, 30 point nanometer. At the moment we see the one layer, two layer graphene and three layer graphene, and you can see the multi-layer graphene, the color contrast is almost you know, bluish kind of thing. So this simple optical microscope is good enough to identify, okay, what is the thickness of kind of this material? For example, there are a lot of chemistry methods. For example, I can do very simple chemistry in a lab where uh, the college, where the facilities are limited. For example, I take, a simple graphite powder. I do oxidation in presence of strong acids such as H2SO4 or HNO3. And then what I will get, I will get the graphite oxide. The moment you do mechanical explosion or thermal explosion, whatever, you'll get uh, this uh, uh, reduced graphite oxide, uh, single layer graphite oxide. But I have to reduce it by using certain uh, reducing agent. For example, I use hydrazine, right, as a good, very good reducing agent. But I will get, I will get the single uh, layer of graphene. And but this is in the form of solution. You can see the actual uh, photograph of the, uh, the graphene, which I have in the solution form. Of course, I can deposit on any kind of substrate and I can use it for uh, the application, whatever I want to use it for field effect transistor or I will do use for biosensor or gas sensor, whatever. Uh, and then of course, the mechanical characterization uh, and the optical characterization as well as, as the surface morphology is very important. You can see that nice TM image, you can see the now, the deeds have been covered by the uh, layer of graphene. Of course, you can do the uh, atomic force microscopy imaging uh, for find out the thickness, but the uh, is not much reliable because the uh, the sample which we have prepared, the kind of substrate we have used, the cleaning of the substrate is very important part of the study, and that need to be uh, do very carefully. Next slide, please. So, in this contrast. What I will do actually, I will do uh, Raman spectroscopy. Raman spectroscopy is very powerful technique uh, to identify uh, whether your sample is one layer graphene, two layer graphene, or three layer graphene. For example, you can see the typical Raman spectra of graphite and graphene. You can see the Raman of graphene, uh, basically in single layer, you can see the uh, blue uh, spectra of a single layer graphene. It has the splitting of phonon branches, very important part of, you can see, uh, it might be, uh, there might be a D peak. In this spectra, there is no D peak because uh, D peak uh, around 1350 centimeters, 1350 centimeters, which is appears because of the D peak presence in the graphene. The presence of disorder in SP2 hybridized carbon system 
results in a resonance raman spectra and thus makes raman spectroscopy one of the most sensitive technique to characterize disorder present in the sp2 carbon material for example there is another band you can see g band uh, which is known as e2g band around 1500 right basically this g band appears due to the stretching of carbon carbon bond in a graphite material it is highly sensitive to strain effect in sp2 system and thus can be used to probe surface modification happen on the surface of graphene there is another you can see the highly intense 2d band around 2500 Uh, 2800. All kind of sp2 carbon material exhibit a very strong peak in the uh, this range in Raman spectra. Basically, 2d band is a second order two phonon process and it exhibits a strong frequency dependence on the excitation laser energy. Therefore, this kind of band is used to find out the number of number of layers or thickness of graphene sheet uh, uh, which we have uh, exploited on the uh, the substrate. Uh, next slide, please. you can see the moment uh, you can see the intensity difference also you can see the g band and 2d band the moment uh, the, uh, you make come to uh, bilayer graphene you can see the intensity of g band and 2d band is nearly same and you can see the 2d band actually split into different band and this has been well explained by the rebel double resonant raman spectra i am not going to discuss here in detail but this is very important you can simply uh, distinguish to one layer two layer three layer and multi layer and this happen because of the phonon splitting band splitting uh, and at uh, phonon splitting at basically km is mirror things and this has been uh, those who want to read uh, care, uh, detail they can uh, refer this paper published in physical regulator in 2004 they explain the uh, phonon splitting and band splitting as a number of layers uh, next slide please next slide please you can see the uh now uh, the raman spectroscopy of graphene with one layer two layer you can see one layer the intensity of uh, now this second band you can see as compared to first band first g band and 2d band you can see the intensity is almost two three times in bilayer you can see the intensity is almost just similar in nature again you can see but 2d band uh, the g uh, 2d band is split the second band is split into multiple bands okay but in one layer it is only na single band right single you can cannot fit many multiple fittings okay you can see three layer then four layer you can see five layer how the intensity na has been drastically come down and all these things how na g band has been improved okay next slide please okay again raman spectroscopy becomes very powerful technique okay to characterize okay whether your sample is graphite or graphene oxide or reduced graphene oxide this is very important question for the student at bachelor and master level how to distinguish because all looks black Okay, or look that means doesn't graphene or doesn't graphite ion or doesn't reduce graphene oxide, right? Okay, you can see the Raman spectroscopy. Uh, typical, you take a typical graphite crystal and you see the Raman spectroscopy. You just monitor the G band. Okay, you will see the very sharp G band around 1581 centimeter mass. The moment, the moment you do uh, convert this graphite into graphite oxide, because graphite oxide has lot of functional groups. You can see the left side, lot of functional group has been attached. So because of that, it has introduced a defects. Okay, again, Raman spectroscopy becomes one of the powerful technique to characterize the defects. For example, now you can see the peak around 1363 centimeters, uh, 16, 1363 centimeters uh, as a D defect band. And you can see the moment of this now uh, G band from 1581 centimeters to 1594. Okay, you can see the kind of the strain stretch it has because I just mentioned the G band is very sensitive to the kind of modification ha happen on the surface of graphene. a uh, graphite right okay it is just modified okay then the moment you reduce the graphite oxide to reduce graphite oxide we see the kind of the the position the intensity of t band and g band okay you have lot of defects in now in reduced graphene oxide therefore the intensity of d band has been enhanced as compared to g band in graphite oxide uh, next slide please okay so we have made lot of the kind of devices based on the exploited uh, this graphene layer and then the uh, graphene which we have produced by simple chemistry technique and all these things this required uh, the equipment which is scanning electron microscope equipped with the patterning uh, generator and align system and basically uh, next slide please what do you do we take uh, uh, the deposit uh, material on the silicon dioxide substrate the moment we deposit we deposit the polymer the kind of polymer which needed is uh, basically pma we expose that kind of film with the Uh, electron beam dose and the moment we have 
done the exposure the development uh, to do the development of pattern then you have to do a lot of processing for example you have to do uh, metal contacts and all these things afterwards we have to do lift up in acetone the moment you have done lift up and all these things then you can again go to optical microscope and see the kind of device which we have made next slide please okay you can see that this is process the optical microscope image of the single layer graphene and the moment uh, the device has been fabricated the same uh, graphene sheet uh, after fabrication of device so this kind of devices for example we have made a pore contact device and the moment you have pore contact device you can see the electrical properties of this uh, device you can see the piston device uh, which is ambipolar in nature because graphene apply negative gate voltage or positive gate voltage it shows the conductivity uh, towards the uh, device okay next slide please okay do can do lot of uh, this kind of application of these devices for example you can make graphene more p type or you can make graphene more n type depending upon the certain chemistry which you can play with the device and all these things next slide please for example i have uh, the graphene prepared by this just simple chemistry method where just ultrasonication all these things so can more uh, you can have a p pattern device and the moment i have p pattern device i can drop cast the uh, this uh, loose graphene oxide sample in between the drain source i can anneal the device and i can do the electrical measurement and i can use it for certain application next slide please so for example uh, uh, the kind of various graphene for example i can uh, make a piston nitrogen dove graphene as well as i can do boron dove graphene so that my intention is to make graphene more p type or graphene more n type and then these can be used certainly for certain kind of targeted application for example this graphene n dope i have used for no2 uh, gas sensing application for example the stability of the gas sensor for example humidity sensor is very important and all these things so we have monitored this kind of uh, the test uh, for longer time and find that this uh, graphene uh, which we have prepared a uh, certain good Uh, application uh, for uh, the stability test for the humidity sensor device and uh, of course next slide please graphene has tremendously lot of application uh, not only uh, for the electronic devices but for many other uh, device application and all these things it has certain uh, um, application to solar uh, cell ba battery super capacitor as a electrode uh, kind of thing and the di display for the solar cell packaging and all these things because of the still uh, people are trying to open a band gap by using certain engineering uh, to this graphene of course the science and engineering has to be identify uh, has to be understand properly so it has to use this material for some technological uh, application uh, sir uh, how many how much time i have hello hello, hello sir Ha, ah, fifteen minutes. You can extend fifteen minutes, sir. Yeah, I will please in a ten minutes or fifteen. No minutes, problem. Sir. No problem. Yeah, yeah. I can. Otherwise, you can just because they are no, waiting. No, no, no. No problem. Night. No problem. No problem. We have extended. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Please. Yeah. Uh, okay. Another kind of materials uh, which is known as transitional metal dichalcogenides. Because, for example, one of the family of this material is molybdenum disulfide. You see, uh, the molybdenum sandwiched between two sulfur atoms. The thickness of one layer of this MOS2 is nearly 0.62 nanometer. So this makes one layer of MOS2. So tell you what is the advantage of this material? Because graphene, there is there is no band gap, but these are naturally semiconducting material. Depending upon thickness, whether you have one layer of MOS2, two layer of MOS2, three layer or multi layer of MOS2, you can twin the Now band gap of this material. So depending upon certain application, okay. So two layer MOS two, three layer MOS two may be useful for some kind of photo detector or biosensor application. So, so this can be optimized. Next slide, please. For example, there are certain materials. For example, you can take the example of boron nitride, MOS two, graphene. For example, now the kind of band gap uh, this material having. You can see the the, the band gap of graphene, the one layer of MOS two, multi layer, and then the and a certain material for example are also working on black phosphorus very important material covering wide range of this uh, visible spectrum so that this material have the te real technological application but, but because of the some stability issues people are certainly working on this material uh, but there are some limitation and but they will certainly find some solution for it next slide please. 
So, for example, if you take an example of this, uh, uh, you can see the band structure of this MOS2. You can see the the band structure of single layer MOS2 and bulk MOS2. You can see the moment uh, you know, bulk MOS2. You see how the band gap is opening, right? For the single layer MOS2, you can see how band gap become wider as compared to bulk MOS2. When bulk the band gap is around 1.2 electron hour. The moment you make a single layer MOS2, the band gap becomes 1.7, 1.6 1.7 electron volt. So this is fully uh, phonon dispersion of single layer MOS2, and you can see the this is a uh, top view of the single layer of MOS2. Next slide, please. Again, uh, you can use uh, very nice chemistry uh, to synthesize this materials. For example, I take bulk MOS2 powder. It's really a uh, very cheap available uh, in any kind of uh, vendor. What you have to do actually? You have to do n between lithium. This is very cautious uh, um, uh, experiment. You have to monitor thoroughly because between lithium is very dangerous. And basically, uh, the moment you put it this powder into n between lithium, you have to replace in hexane for three days. And what happened? Uh, this lithium, uh, this lithium has characteristic sticks. It, it goes in between these layers. You can see the uh, na, the uh, structure which I have shown MOS2. The lithium goes in between these things. And uh, what happened? You take the this uh, thing uh, after three days, and you just do ultrasonication. What happened? You will get separate out this few layer of MOS2. Okay, just, you don't want to wait for three days. You want to do this ex experiment in one day. What you again? You take this MO3 uh, precursor and this uh, 2K SCM precursor, and you do this uh, hydrothermal experiment. Okay, in presence of water, right? And you heat these things up for 180 degrees Celsius for 24 hours, and you can do this uh, na, remaining like separation and a filter out experiment, and you will get few layer of MOS2. Okay, you want to separate, synthesize the material in just three hours. For example, what you take this kind of na, H2MO4 precursor and this another NH4C NH2 precursor, and you can heat this uh, solution again for 500 degrees Celsius at three hours, and you will get few layer of MOS2. Next slide, please. Okay, just th those who want to wait for three hours, they want to uh, synthesize material in just few seconds. Okay, so what you can do, you take a laser technique, uh, you take some, uh, uh, so for example, I have black phosphorus synthesized in presence of dispersed in a IPA, uh, so small crystals, uh, of course, beaker, which I use is a quartz beaker because I want to pass the laser beam through this beaker. And the moment you shine, uh, of course, there are a lot of parameters. You have to insert argon because you have to uh, avoid the oxidation and all these things. And you have to optimize the laser energy, the kind of argon gas flow and all these things. And then you can, of course, the synthesize these materials in just few seconds. Okay. And then, of course, uh, we are free to do a lot of this uh, imaging by using transmission electron microscopy, uh, atomic post microscopy and all these things. And then Really imagine you can see real that this is a TM image of a uh, few layer MOS. You can see nicely in a hexagonal structure, and these are uh, the boundary. You can see that the distance between two boundaries also you can directly measure from transmission electron microscopy. Next slide, please. Yeah, again, uh, this, the same technique which I have used for fabricating single layer graphene, that's a micro mechanical like squash tape technique. Here also, you can take this uh, uh, highly crystal, uh, highly pure kind of uh, crystal of MOS2 and all these chalcogenides. And you can put the straw tape and then of course you can uh, remove the squash tape and put it on a SO2 substrate and you can go to optical microscope. You can see the different, uh, uh, the color contrast and identify whether it was MOS2 is one layer, two layer or multi layer. Next slide, please. Okay, for example, uh, there is no uh, choice, uh, there is no uh, uh, restriction that the kind of substrate thickness, uh, the SO2 thickness you can use. For example, I can use 50 nanometer SO2 or I can use 300 nanometer SO2, 500 nanometer SO2, but we need to understand what is the color contrast. So next slide, please. So there is a uh, very uh, small uh, physics behind it uh, to how to uh, identify the which kind of color contrast I am expecting. So just optical microscope is good enough actually to identify the number of layers present in any kind of this graphene uh, prepared by squash tip technique uh, from highly paralytic graphite or highly pure uh, kind of single layer MOS2. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, the moment, uh, this is a simple, uh, okay, I have to do simple 12 standard calculation. And you, if you and I know the intensity of flake, intensity of substrate, and I just do uh, the simple calculation, I will get 
the kind of optical contrast as a function of SI2 thickness and the wavelength which I have used in optical microscope. For example, this calculation also can be uh, done for, uh, for example, a certain number of layers as a function of wavelength use or as a function of SI2 thickness use in the uh, uh, physics point of view. Next slide, please. For example, these calculations have been done uh, as a function of number of layers and wavelength use. For example, I have uh, varied the substrate also. For example, I have used 15 nanometer SI2 substrate or I have varied the 300 nanometer SI2 substrate or 500 nanometer So That doesn't matter. We need to calculate what the kind of layer, uh, layers present on in the calculations and the wavelength which you have used in the optical microscope. So that gives you the actual color contrast and that you can match with your experimental findings. Next slide, please. For example, again, uh, Raman spectroscopy become very important here. Uh, okay, you don't have any other characterization to find out the thickness of the MOS2. The MOS2, Raman spectro of MOS2 uh, actually shows the two peaks which is known as uh, strong in-plane E1G mode, which is around, you can see around uh, 380, right? Uh, which is a strong in-plane mode. And there is another uh, peak around uh, 4, uh, 4, 10, uh, 410, which is because of the out of plane, which is known as A1G mode, vibration mode. You can see uh, the one layer, two layer, and four layer and six layer. You can see uh, the extreme right side. Now I have shown the most layer as a function of Raman shift. You can see opposite direction shift, which is basically attributed to the Coulombic interaction and possible stacking induced change of the interlayer bonding. You can see the when you see the carefully, these variations are still up to 10 layers. After 10 layer, this MOS2 gives us a bulk, bulk material, like bulk MOS2. There is not much change. You can see if you measure the peak frequency difference between these two uh, more uh, for bulk MOS2. The difference between these two peaks is nearly 26 centimeter inverse. The moment you come to single layer MOS2, the difference is 18 centimeter inverse. So you can monitor 10 layers of MOS2. For bulk MOS2, it is 26 after 10 layers. You as a bulk sample. And the moment you come to single layer, the difference is 18 centimeter inverse. Therefore, the number of layers in the uh, this MOS2 just can be monitored by Raman spectroscopy. You can see the difference of these two modes is reliably used to find out the number of layers present in the MOS2. Uh, next slide, please. Again, uh, uh, this kind of uh, devices uh, application, it has uh, been used in, for example, field effect transistor. Next slide, please, sir. So for example, for developing any device technology, developing reliable encapsulation layer is essential for removing the interaction with molecules in the environment, thereby providing stable operation over time. This is particularly very important for the materials with molecular scale or atomic scale, where all atoms are on the surface, hence making all these things, all these atoms highly susceptible to the environment. Specifically, you can see uh, in this particular figure, large hysteresis has been commonly observed in current versus gate voltage characteristics. It is undesirable for reliable field effect transistor operation and logic circuit designed as it leads to the shift in threshold voltage as a function of voltage shifting range and direction. For example, hysteresis, basically this arises because of the trap states in the dielectric or semiconductor dielectric interface, trap charges induced by water molecules absorbed onto the, into the vicinity of the semiconductor channel, absorption of ambient molecules on the surface of emotions such as water molecules and oxygen molecules. Water molecules can easily respond to the high electric field and they can be aligned by forming a serial bond water. And we have done some experimental uh, technique to reduce this hysteresis. Next slide, please. So the, for example, you can see the kind of devices which we have made again, uh, single layer MOS we have taken and then we have fabricated uh, the device uh, by using standard electron beam lithography technique. We have measured the thickness of the uh, one layer of MOS2 by using AFM. And then you can see the, uh, the device actually fabricated at extreme context for uh, uh, certain measurements and then basically uh, once your device contacts are measured you can do electrical characterization and this electrical characterization shows you can see uh, the hysteresis as a function of different uh, this gate voltage shifting direction and then the hysteresis also coming because of the okay oxygen experiment has been done uh, in a 
uh, vacuum and without vacuum you can see experiment also done uh, in presence of humidity a lot of humidity because water molecules okay you can try to increase the humidity level you can see how it has been changed you can remove the uh, no, uh, this water molecules you see dry air uh, relative humidity and uh, how hysteresis has been changed so basically this is the origin of hysteresis in the device next slide please so also you can see there are a lot of you know trap charges next slide please <clears throat> There are a lot of uh, traps. For example, the experiment has been done in presence of na uh, light and without light in dark condition. You can see how the hysteresis na how the na this the large hysteresis loop you can see. So again, it intersection between the dash line. You can see the uh, the threshold voltage has been drastically has been changed. You can see the total na response of the same device at a function of various gate voltages on this thing. This also changes. So this is undesirable properties uh, for the kind of technology. Uh, has been developed for the various application so what we have done very simple experiment uh, next slide please so we have passivated this device just by 30 nanometer of silicon nitride thin film okay when we have to deposit uh, this passivation this experiment has been done at high temperature for example at 300 degree celsius and uh, uh, we have to do again at high temperature and all these things so we can imagine at high temperature in vacuum all the water molecules have been removed And then the contact resistance also have been improved and all these things. And then uh, the channel have been clear. And the, the absorption of water molecules or oxygen molecules, which are functionalized uh, on the surface of the this MOS, has been removed in presence of while making this coating. And once we are done this coating, we are done the measurement. Uh, next slide, please. You can see uh, the analysis uh, uh, of before coating. For example, you can see the A part is uh, just before coating. And you can see the C part is after putting. You can see the current also uh, in the left side. First, uh, you can see the current is nano ampere, and the current is has been input micro ampere. This uh, device is heated at 300 degrees Celsius in vacuum, and to remove the moisture, mobility also enhanced by one order due to the contact resistance improved and the suppressed Coulomb uh, scattering via dielectric screening. As this is also confirmed in uh, earlier PDP transistor devices. Uh, made up of uh, this graphene and all the other layers. Next slide, please. So again, there is a uh, one more important parameter to improve the uh, the the property mobility of these uh, particular devices by using the sandwich or the, the sand layer uh, for dielectric measure for as a dielectric. For example, this particular sand with made up of many number of you can see that there are uh, many number of elements present, and this make a sand of very uh, two to four nanometer thickness. For example, this consists of sulfur, zirconium, hydrogen, molybdenum, and many other elements. So basically, this is known as self-assembled nanodielectrics, which give pretty good uh, dielectric, and uh, uh, this is useful uh, for uh, the transferring the single layer MOS to transistor to get actually a very good field effect transistor mobility. Next slide, please. Okay, moment we have uh, the sample on uh, the kind of SR2 substrate. You can transfer it on any kind of uh, substrate. For example, I want to transfer it on uh, the gel, uh, this sand which I have made. The moment you put the some uh, polymer, for example, PMA I have chosen, and the moment you put PMA, then you can uh, ease by using H you can ease the SiO2 by HF etching, and then uh, once you have ease the SiO2, then we have this uh, PMA and uh, single layer MOS2. Then you can go and transfer on desired substrate, and you can actually. Uh, uh transfer it on any kind of substrate and the moment for example i have transferred it on momi kind of sen sensor so actually i have to use this for certain kind of sensor application this is very important because over here i want to identify whether your my one layer of mos2 sample is very good for sensor or two layer of mos2 sample is very good for the sensor uh, uh, application is very important for example this work the umesh professor umesh wagmare uh, done lot of theoretical calculations on these things and understand The kind of few, uh, two layer or three five layer MOS to sample is very good for NO2 and ammonium application. The basic principle of gas sensing in all 2D uh, transition metal drive circuit is mainly based on the charge transfer process between the gas molecules and the surface of sensing materials. Different from the conventional metal oxides, the 2D metal acts as a charge acceptor or donor, resulting in a resistance or conductance change of the overall system. Once exposed to reactive gas, uh, gas molecules are Absorbed on the surface of 2D materials by electrostatic force, the direction of electron charge transfer is determined by the type of reactive gas, either reducing or oxidizing. The resistance of the sensing material is recovered up to its initial value due to 
desorption of the gas molecules upon exposure to air or nitrogen the amount of resistance modulation is determined by the charge affinity of reactive gas to release or withdraw electrons using p type 2d materials as an example the resistance of the sensing material usually increases under the exposure of reducing gas for example this is for uh, two layer or five layer of uh, mo2 samples next slide please okay you can see uh, this is a typical uh, experimental setup you can uh, uh, test gas uh, ammonia or no2 and then uh, the reference gas nitrogen on air there is mixing chamber you have connected uh, kept the device in a chamber and it has been connected to a electrical machine for example i use here a kethli semiconductor analyzer and you can monitor the moment you pass the gas you can monitor the changes have happened electrical changes happen on the uh, in the device for example the kind of the measurement we can do uh, here is the for example ammonia i just mentioned the ammonia and the no2 one is reducing and one is oxidizing oxidizing gas the moment the changes we are expecting here Uh, is very important for example ammonia is end uh, basically end dope okay it is end of the material electron donor and no2 is a p dope p dopant or it is actually electron acceptor what happened that uh, the, there is a charge transfer between the gas molecules and the mo2 sheet occurred resulting in a change in the resistance so there is a charge depletion in the mo2 sheet which reduces the number of electrons and thus reduces the number of charge carriers and enhances its electrical resistance for example in charge accumulation which leads to decreasing resistance the strong interaction between gas molecules and mo2 sheet leads to significant change in the conductivity of mo2 for example the ammonia which i have shown here ammonia is an electron donating gas it possesses end doping characteristics upon exposure to mo2 channel it injects the charges towards the surface which in turn shift the fermi level of conduction band of mo2 which leads to the decreasing the resistance of the sensor basically the sensitivity the depend on ability of donating charges or absorption energy in the ammonia is much higher than as compared to other molecules that's where the sensitivity of you know the kind of no2 molecule uh, which i have shown here is higher so gas molecules were absorbed on the mo2 sheet uh, by uh, you know various kind of uh, method like argon flow heat or u exposure <coughs> by the way you can uh, improve the uh, response and recovery time next slide please yeah i can actually monitor uh, ammonia gas concentration as a function of sensitivity you can see this is measurement done for two layer mo2 or five layer mo2 also you can tune the sensitivity by applying the gate voltage so this is the uh, first time we have introduced a technique we can apply gate voltage and you can uh, actually inject certain kind of charges and you can improve the sensitivity for example this has been done for you can see how much is the change in sensitivity for example you can see no2 concentration and uh, see without uh, gate rotation with, uh, with it uh, applying gate voltage you see there is a tremendous change in the sensitivity you can control actually sensitivity for example uh, the kind of gas sensing molecules which you want to sense uh, for the application next slide please okay actually we have done this uh, na, the uh, devices were actually mounted on the chip uh, and, uh, and then have been monitored for certain application for example here this has been used in a industrial application for example ammonia gas sensing all these things so it has to be monitored and all these things and then you can see how uh, the, uh, this is a real optical image of the device you can control uh, the threshold voltage as a function of uh, gas concentration as well. you can see how the threshold voltage is getting changed as a function of uh, uh, gas concentration next slide please okay uh, the another important issue with the this uh, kind of this material is this uh, recovery time okay how we can recover the device very fast for example you have done na the kind of na red light for example you have used the green light or red light and you can see how the uh, there is a change in the recovery time okay? still there is a chance of uh, improving the uh, recovery time basically uh, by shining these lights you are able to um, uh, remove lots of uh, this gas molecules they are uh, sit on the your surface and then Uh, you, you are trying to improve the uh, the absorption of molecules uh, faster next slide please so done another experiment uh, again with raman spectroscopy we want to find out whether your the gas sensing mechanism is basically a charge transfer or some other mechanism so what we have done actually we have again taken the this coils optical window 
and then we put the device in the this coils window and uh, from one side we have uh, passed the gas from the other we have passed the dry air or nitrogen and then we have passed the ammonia gas then before also we have recorded the raman spectroscopy you can see the pristine mos2 without passing the ammonia gas you can see the moment uh, we have passed the gas we have again we have recorded the raman spectroscopy so uh, raman spectroscopy and then we have uh, now the plotted the comparative raman spectra of uh, pristine mos2 without passing gas and after uh, uh, mos2 gas you can see uh, there is a no, large change in the uh, raman spectroscopy and this basically uh, confirm that the charge transfer is the basic mechanism uh for the gas sensing uh, of this material okay next slide please when you compare the, this uh, transition metal dial questionnaire as a sensor uh, as a traditional metal oxide you can see uh, the in uh, this kind of this uh, uh, all 2d materials there is a high electron mobility at but all operate at low low temperature or room temperature basically in metal oxide we have short response time low cost long term stability scalable fabrication but till we are at the beginning so a uh, lot many thing has to be happen uh, for example you have to work on low energy consumption uh, high uh, gas response uh, compatibility of the material basically uh, me mechanical stability and flexibility is very also important there are certain disadvantages and uh, as compared to metal oxide for example selectivity is still an issue and uh, the cost of the material is very high still at present because uh, not at able to produce on large scale and basically when you compare metal oxide uh, the operating temperature is one of the big issue because all metal oxide semiconductor works at very high temperature and basically advantage here where this all transition metal dielectric based sensor works at room temperature next slide please okay what you have done very simple explain again we have made a hybrid kind of these devices for example here i have a few layer of mos2 on few layer of mos2 i have decorated sn2 nanoparticle so what is the advantage of coating uh, sn2 nanoparticle on this few layer mos2 is mos2 nanosheets with high surface area naturally which provides a platform for attaching the sn2 nanoparticles which prevent their interparticle aggregation when you do the experiment with pristine sn2 nanoparticle you can see they intercalate in between aggregation there is a lot of aggregation happens because of that your sensitivity decreases right? uh, uh, the response time and recovery time it decreases okay so the moment you make sn2 mos2 hybrid structure which provides large specific surface area which is of great benefit to numerous oxygen molecules which absorb onto the sn2 facilitating diffusion of ethanol gas for example which i have shown here which improves the reaction of ethanol with surface absorbed oxygen operating temperature significantly decreases as compared to the uh, metal oxide semiconductor the activation energy for surface reaction is lowered by sn2 uh, at mos2 you can see also the active sites which provided by mos2 nanosheet and also good interaction between two materials uh, for example the mos2 which i have chosen here is a p type semiconductor and the sn2 which i have chosen is n type semiconductor basically they form a same fermi energy level at interface the moment we have same fermi energy level then we have very good selectivity sensitivity and all these things basically the selectivity of a gas sensor is the ability that a sensor can distinguish different kinds of gases which is also important for gas sensing properties and application next slide please then again you can see the experiment the uh, the sensitivity or response of the gas sensor as a function of different concentration has been shown you can see the very good response and recovery time of this uh, material and this is a schematic uh, mos2 sheet on, on which is known to nanoparticle has been assembled and you see how uh, because of the large surface area how the it, So, uh, actually prevents the interparticle aggregation this is very important property and due to uh, the prevention of this interparticle aggregation it gives a lot of sites uh, significant sites and then it gives very good sensitivity uh, for the kind of sensor which we have shown for example next slide please this, this experiment can be done for various other application for example uh, i have chosen another experiment with zinc oxide mos2 okay you can see how this behaves as a sensing properties again the uh the response is same next slide please okay what we have done a very simple experiment uh, done by uh, mr mahendra uh, who is now submitting phd thesis what you have done uh, you have taken actually uh, this sns2 uh, an mos2 and then uh, monitored the superintendent and sedimentation and you can see the different color uh, because of the uh, the sheet which he has got is having different thickness and all these things next slide please 
okay and then this kind of the most to nano state he where he has got actually again he has trans make a flexible emos to photo detector and again this p pattern device and the moment you can uh, use uh, this uh, graphene as a uh, uh, electrode and emos to as a channel next slide please the moment he has done all these things moment he has done all this measurement like viscosity measurement solid loading and all these things uh, graphite as a channel uh, electrode and the moment you put all these things and you can uh, Of course, you do a lot of experiment before doing actual measurement, thermal annealing, photo nuclear annealing, and all these things. You can see the fin as a channel and most to, and uh, the kind of electrical measurement is shown very very important. Again, uh, next slide please. The fully printed most to graphene photo detector, uh, which prepared shows very good response and uh, for the kind of devices for flexible device application it can be used. Again, uh, next slide please. We want large area. Uh, most of the kind of. Katraalaala. Sampo mana lo kore katraalaala. Large area chemical vapor deposition of monolayer transition metal gel ki jonar is temperature. Hello sir. Hello sir. Hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear me right i will finish in a few minute yeah 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 please please yeah. okay no uh, please go to uh, next slide ha huh? yeah yeah uh, the and then same mahendra has done this uh, na growth of this uh, all transition metal gel cuisinery is by using uh, chemical vapor deposition basically uh, you taken the kind of precursors for example you have to uh, synthesize mos2 or mos2 so you have taken the kind of precursors for mos2 and uh, uh, selenium or sulfur uh, pass argon as a carrier gas hydrogen as a uh, reducing gas uh, for fabricating uh, the single layer of mos2 and few uh, few layer of mos2 basically it is a self seeding growth uh, suboxone nanoparticle act as a nucleation sites uh, for the monolayer after reducing of uh, tmd vapor typically precursors are heated at evaporation point and the vapors generated are transferred to substrate for example so2 with the help of carrier gas such as argon and hydrogen gas act as a reducing ga uh, gas the triangular shape is formed by thermodynamically variable edges of either mo or sulfur uh, atoms and uh, as compared to three fourth symmetry of the half unit shell of the single layer uh, transition metal dye cyclone is compared to six fourth symmetry of the bulk for example if molybdenum to sulfur ratio is more than 1 to 2 then it forms a triangular shape onto the substrate with molybdenum terminated boundary the single layers were well aligned with the relative orientation of the edges in the multiple of 60 degree this can be confirmed by measuring the area of equilateral triangle next slide please for example i just mention how the 3 4 symmetry is important uh, as compared to 6 4 symmetry in the bulk so that's why it forms a uh, uh, triangular shape uh, mos2 or mos2 for example this material also can next slide please can be grown on Uh, like a, uh, like a different substrate. For example, I have chosen uh, gold coated uh, for uh, substrate, and then can be uh, grow this kind of material with triangular shape by using the same technique. Of course, you can use this uh, sample for electrical measurement. Next slide, please. And it shows good uh, mobility. And uh, of course, uh, one of the issues is still an issue because we have to do a lot of we have to understand a lot of chemistry uh, behind it. The the material which we grow. Uh, the the kind of environment it has this plays a very important role uh, for kind of measurements uh, which are doing next slide please okay next slide please yeah yeah okay okay i want to grow uh, by centimeter film okay so what i can do actually i'll just coat the I take the sapphire subset and i coat the mo3 powder the moment i have mo3 powder like few layer thickness and then i'll just you have bread uh, using hydrogen and argon can do in presence of sulfur uh, sulfur we bread 120 degrees celsius the moment to your mo3 operation and what happen this reaction takes plus mo3 hydrogen is a reducing as and you layer first reaction instant you will get mo3 and had uh, h2o gas the moment you reduce it you will get the mo2 next slide please now the moment we have this kind of samples then Uh, you can actually transfer on any kind of substrate the moment you transfer on for example i have synthesized on gold foil or uh, this so2 substrate i can transfer it on flexible substrate because i cannot grow it on 
na this uh, cape town substrate or flexible substrate because they can't uh, sustain at high temperature i have to grow it on the silicon substrate and all these things then moment i transfer again i can do raman spectroscopy and i can actually confirm okay how many layers we have actually trans can uh, transfer on the this kind of flexible substrate and uh, again i can do uh, this is a flexible the, the experiment which i have shown earlier uh, the flexible sensor and all these things okay next slide please uh, so again when to grow it industry skill industry demand okay fully uh, vapor okay again i can take uh, this experiment has been done uh, with the help of professor sandesh jadkar from university of pune they have this uh, hfcvd method so hfcvd so we have to heat the for example i have to synthesize a tungsten disulfide so i will take tungsten wire heat the filament at vibration temperature around 2000 degrees celsius and i will pass the h2s gas okay the precursor of sulfur the moment the reaction happens in presence of uh, this gas in uh, the vacuum chamber and the before uh, the because of the filament temperature and continuous bombardment of h2s gas tungsten itself can incorporate into the thin film by forming wh2 radicals and before reaching the substrate the radicals and gas phase reaction takes place and it forms actually a wh2 uh, thin film so you can there are certain parameters like vacuum uh, the temperature and all these things you can control the thickness of the film and all this and of course you can do lot of other measurements and um, uh, confirm what kind of technological application uh, it can be used next slide please for example you have done uh, the xrd measurement uh, raman spectroscopy again and all these things the transmittance measurement and all these things right and the kind of uh, the application for example you can use it for uh, say you know field effect transistor or photo detector application and all these things and of course you can characterize by different technique like transpiece electron and all these things maybe i think sir i will stop here and uh, yeah 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 thank you very much sir if anybody is having question you may ask in chat box or directly friends if there are uh, no questions then uh, uh kale sir is there <coughs> hello sir kale sir is there yes so there are certain uh, questions on chat box right uh, there is any alternative found as today used for the synthesis of graphene oxide rgo uh, for himmer's method uh, is there any technique used to confirm of 1d 2d graphene layers uh, in the future it is possible at ordinary laboratory okay uh, first question uh, uh, still there is an alternative uh, for himmer's method it is largely been used to produce graphite oxide and reduce graphene oxide and uh, another question confirmation of 1d and 2d materials so this can be uh, done by for example first by uh, scanning uh, basically transmission electron microscopy uh, scanning trailing microscopy and uh, then there are certain spectroscopic technical so where you can confirm whether your sample is uh, now 1d or 2d and all these things thank you sir <coughs> hello hello uh, prasad sir hello hello uh, kale sir or prasad sir is there i am there i am here prasad is here sir shall we conclude yeah we can conclude uh, maybe i can just make uh, some remarks like you know let yeah, okay. us all the speakers Uh, Professor Vagbare, Professor uh, Panath, and then uh, Dr. Latte. Uh, yeah. Uh, very nice. And uh, uh, sorry, we had uh, slightly exceeded the time, uh, so we had some difficulties. Uh, so let me we thank all the people who have uh, you know joined us, and you know on behalf of uh, Maharashtra Academy of Science, MRSI, and MRSI Pune chapter. 
I thank all of you for joining in, and I also thank the uh, uh, organizers, uh, Professor uh, Tube and Dr. Dhole, uh, for taking all the efforts and then arranging uh, this talk uh, through their uh, college. Uh, uh, we hope that you all had a good time. Uh, uh, I thank you know, all the organizers uh, from uh, Maharashtra Academy of Sciences as well as uh, from uh, the MRSI uh, office bearers. I thank all of them for. Uh, uh, giving the, uh, us kind of you know, a platform for kind of showcasing what is going on in the area of advanced function materials. Uh, thank you. Uh, have a good day. Uh, stay home. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My colleague will make it. Uh, presentation. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, I'm Sarah Kumar from Maharashtra Academy of Science. One day international workshop on advances in functional materials. Friends, on the behalf of Department of Chemistry, New York's Commerce and Science College, and our parent institute, Ahmednagar Zilla Maratha Vidya Prasarak Samaj, I am here to propose a vote of thanks to all the helping hands for us. First, would I would like to thank a Material Research Society of India. Uh, Maharashtra Academy of Sciences and New York's Commerce and Science College partner for organizing this event jointly. Friends, it's my immense pleasure to have a proposed a vote of thanks for a Padmasri awardee, Professor G.D. Yadav sir, President Maharashtra Academy of Sciences. Friends, in his inaugural speech, he has given a very motivational talk. I am thankful to Professor G.D. Yadav sir. In spite of his busy schedule, he has given us a time, valuable time and share the views. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Secondly, I would like to say a thank you to Professor S.B. Krupanidhi, President Material Research Society of India, IISC Bangalore. In welcome address, sir has motivated our researchers and students toward the research of material science. Thank you very much, sir, for being a part of this wonderful event. Next, I would like to say a big, big thank you to Dr. Bharat Kale, sir, the director of CIMED Pune and a secretary of Maharashtra Academy of Sciences. Sir, always help us and guide us in organizing this event. The man behind this success, I must say, is Dr. Bharat Kale, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for your continuous support and behind us putting the helpful hands. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Next, I would like to say a sincere thanks to all three eminent personality who has delivered a lecture today, Professor Umesh Wagmare sir, JNCSR, Bangalore. With a simple word, sir has explained a ferroelectric crystals and its exciting application. It was a very nice talk with sir and the things he has shared will definitely help us in developing our research culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for giving such a nice and wonderful lecture. Friends, next, I would like to say a big thank you to Dr. Rahul Panath, sir, from USA. As we are having a difference in our timing, still, sir, has delivered a very wonderful lecture and it was touching the most of the points which are nowadays in a focus that includes nanoparticle 3D print printing for next generation, brain computer interfaces, biosensing devices, and lithium ion battery. These all names we have heard in nowadays topics. Sir has given a very good view of all these topics. Sir, in spite of a night there, you have spent a lot of time for us. Thank you very much for giving such a nice, wonderful presentation as well as lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. 
last but not the least i would like to say a big thank you to our prominent alumni who always help the students from rural area and motivate them towards the research dr dattatrey late sir csir ncl pune sir has given always a motivation and a view to the student for a research thank you thank you very much sir friends our organization has given us a permission for conducting this event jointly with a material research society of india and maharashtra academy of sciences so i would like to th say a thank you to our principal dr r k ahir sir vice principal and head of our department dr d r thube sir and a coordinator my friend anil dhole sir for organizing such a nice and wonderful event for the researchers and students along with these all people i would like to say a big thank you to all my colleagues who have helped us in different way to organize this event and motivate us as a guide for this event friends last but not least it will be not completed without saying thank you to our participants teachers and researchers who have registered for this event and make this event a grand success with their registration and being participated in this lahu event with this note i would like to say thank you to one and all for being a part of this sir i would like to lastly a thank you blv prasad sir for being present here since morning till the concluding sir has given a valuable time for us thank you very much sir with this i think it should be over with the formal vote formal vote of thanks thank you very much for giving me a opportunity to propose our sincere thanks to all thank you thank you very much